In just a few moments, we will have our 8 p.m. poll closings. But before that, I'm here with Simone Sanders Townsend, host of Simone, former Obama campaign manager and White House senior advisor David Plouffe, and former Florida Republican Congressman Carlos Corbello. Carlos, let's go to you first. I think we will have over two-thirds of the vote in uh, from Florida. What is happening down there? Florida, 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 yeah. right? That's a, a word that's been said many times in these studios and nights like this. And I think uh, what we're seeing now raises two important questions. Number one, is Florida still the perennial swing state? It doesn't look like one tonight. It looks like <laughs> it sure Republicans doesn't. are solidly putting Florida in their column. And then number two, and it'd be interesting to hear what David has to say about this, the Obama coalition, Hispanics. Yeah. Obama put so much work into growing that Hispanic vote in the state of Florida for the Democratic Party. You look at the numbers in Miami-Dade, they are staggering. Mm -hmm. Is the Obama coalition broken? Can Democrats continue to rely on that coalition? In the early numbers tonight, it looks like the answer might be no. Of course, we got to see what happens in the rest of the country, Virginia 7, South Texas, the Hispanic vote in Arizona. But these numbers are ominous for Democrats. Let's just review and refresh folks uh, in terms of those numbers. Right now, with two thirds of the vote, and Miami Dade looks like it is going for Marco Rubio over Val Demings in that Senate race by eight points. Statewide, Marco Rubio is up 11 points. Um, I'll paraphrase Carlos's question there, David Pluff. I mean, what is. What is the lesson you are drawing here in terms of the Hispanic vote? How alarmed should Democrats be? Well, in Florida, it's catastrophic. So obviously, we saw great erosion in 20 in the presidential race. And let's remember, Barack Obama won in 2012, basically tied the Cuban vote, got over 70% of the Hispanic vote. So the Obama coalition in Florida is gone. We've got to rebuild it now. The question will be in Arizona, in Nevada, huge Hispanic vote in North Carolina, Virginia. What do we see there? I would be surprised to see anywhere near the erosion we're seeing in Florida. I think this may be contained in Florida, maybe along some of the border in South Texas where we saw some problems, and in West Texas in 2020. Uh, but this is a massive problem. I'm from Electoral College chessboard, if you're looking ahead to 24, if you basically cede those 29 electoral votes from the very beginning, mm -hmm. it gives the Republicans a huge advantage. And look at these numbers tonight. Uh, you're going to be hard-pressed to mount a competitive campaign. Now, now, state of the economy, who do the Republicans nominate? There's a lot that goes into that, but talk about change over 10 years. Uh, it is historically meaningful what's happening. Okay, for, but for, this is an yeah. investment issue, though, also, yeah. because the Democratic Party, look, if you go back to 2018, the National Democratic Party gave over a million dollars to the Florida Democratic Party. This year, they barely gave 700000 That means pennies for Miami-Dade's Democratic Party, other folks across the state. If you look at the last couple governor's races, mm -hmm. um, where even Democrats lost, they were within a percentage point or less. This is not competitive tonight. And to me, that means that there needs to be some internal conversations about infrastructure. What does the infrastructure look like? If the Miami Democratic, uh, the Miami Day Democratic Party chair um, was our Florida Dem chair was already out this morning, basically saying, we've done what we could. The national folks have written us off. And I think that's a real conversation to have to the point that you just made. I agree. And infrastructure investment money, but there's massive message problems with this critical voting cohort in Miami Dade. That we've got to get on top of. And Alex, just for some additional context, Republicans used to pray that they would lose Miami Dade by a, a manageable margin. <laughs> yeah. That was the goal. Now they're winning it by potentially double digits. The, the, the change is just drastic. But to give people hope, Alex. Florida, yes, I'm going to give people a little hope, okay? <laughs> Florida, okay, what's happening in Florida, the shellacking is not, in my opinion, indicative of what folks are going to see across the country. Florida is special. Right. And also, Thank you. <laughs> Latino Florida voters Indian. are not monolith. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. There's the a diversity, down okay? Down in right. Florida are going to be different than they are in other parts of the country where there's a strong Latino population or a large Latino population. We've so got to look at a lot more vote in a lot more states before we draw any conclusions about the Latino The vote. night is young. Simone Sanders Towns and David Pluff, Carlos Corbello, thank you all for your expertise and wisdom tonight. Rachel, back to you. I pity any of us who are ever described as special the way Simone <laughs> just described Florida as special. God protect any of us who have that ever directed at us. I felt that in my guts. All right, uh, we're about 40 seconds, 35 seconds from the top of the hour, from 8 p.m. Eastern time. And the importance of 8 p.m. Eastern time is that we've got poll closings, but there's more poll closings at this 8 o'clock benchmark than there are at any other time of the night. So we're about to get more projections 
projections. Some of them may be too early to call in a number of cases. But we're about to get more projections in more states than we get at any other time of the night. Uh, again, 8 o'clock, the key races that we're going to be looking at in here uh, are places like Pennsylvania and New Hampshire, where there are very close races. But we've got a bunch of governor's races up. We've got a bunch of Senate races up. Uh, and here's what the NBC News election desk tells us we can tell you about those races at this hour, at 8 p.m. Eastern. In the Florida Senate race, the projected winner is incumbent Republican Marco Rubio. In the Pennsylvania Senate race, the very closely watched race there, it is too early to call between Democrat John Fetterman and Republican Mehmet Oz. Again, too early to call in Pennsylvania. In the New Hampshire Senate race, too early to call between incumbent Democrat Senator Maggie Hassan and her Republican challenger Don Balduck. Again, too early to call in New Hampshire. In the Alabama Senate race, Alabama will have a female elected senator for the first time. Republican Katie Britt is the projected winner of the Alabama U.S. Senate race. In the Oklahoma Senate race, there are two of these. This is James Langford, incumbent Democrat, excuse me, incumbent Republican senator running for re-election. He is projected as the winner of this race. He has been re-elected. In the Oklahoma other Senate race, this is a special election to fill the term of retiring U.S. Senator Jim Inhofe. The projected winner in the Oklahoma special is Republican Mark Wayne Mullen. Up to the Northeast, the Connecticut Senate race there. Incumbent Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal facing a challenge from Republican Leora Levy. This is too early to call, but Senator Blumenthal leads in that race. Similarly, in Maryland, we've got an incumbent Democrat, Chris Van Hollen. It is too early to call, but Senator Van Hollen leads in this race against his Republican challenger, Mr. Chafee. In Missouri, in the Missouri Senate race, it is too early to call between Republican Eric Schmidt and Democrat Trudy Bush Valentine, but Eric Schmidt is leading in that Missouri Senate race. And in the Illinois Senate race, where Democratic incumbent Tammy Duckworth is facing a challenge from Republican Kathy Salvi, that race right now is too early to call. Looking at the overall picture of the United States Senate at this hour, look at that. 36 and 36. Democrats control 36 seats, as do the Republicans. There are 28 seats yet to be decided, as is control of the United States Senate. Now, we've got a whole bunch of different governor's races to project for you. The Florida governor's race we'll be looking at first. The projected winner of the Florida governor's race is incumbent Republican Ron DeSantis, defeating Democrat Charlie Crist. In the Pennsylvania governor's race, it is too early to call between Democrat Josh Shapiro and Republican Doug Mastriano. Too early to call in Pennsylvania. In the Maryland governor's race, also too early to call between Democrat Wes Moore and Republican Dan Cox, although Democrat Wes Moore is leading in this race. In the Massachusetts governor's race, again, too early to call between Republican Jeff Deal and Democrat Maura Healey, but Democrat Maura Healey is leading in the Massachusetts governor's race. In the Alabama governor's race, Republican incumbent Governor Kay Ivey is projected to have been reelected as the governor of Alabama. In the Connecticut governor's race, it is too early to call between incumbent Democrat Ned Lamont and his Republican challenger Bob Stefanowski. In the Illinois governor's race, it is J.B. Pritzker, the Democrat incumbent, who is facing a challenge from Republican Darren Bailey. It is too early to call in the Illinois governor's race. In the Maine governor's race, Democratic incumbent Janet Mills is facing a challenge from Republican former Governor Paul LePage. It is too early to call in the Maine governor's race. In the New Hampshire governor's race, it is too early to call between Republican incumbent Chris Sununu and his Democratic challenger Tom Sherman, although Chris Sununu is leading in that race in New Hampshire. In the Rhode Island governor's race, too early to call between incumbent, between incumbent Democrat Daniel McKee and his Republican challenger Ashley Kalis. Too early to call in Rhode Island. In the Tennessee governor's race, the incumbent governor is Republican Bill Lee. He's facing Democratic challenger Jason Martin. This is too early to call, although Bill Lee is leading in that Tennessee governor's race. And finally, in the Oklahoma governor's race, the incumbent there is Republican Kevin Stitt facing a stiff challenge from Democratic challenger Joy Hoffmeister. The Oklahoma governor's race at this hour is too early to call. We've got a winner to project in the South Carolina governor's race. The incumbent Republican Henry McMaster is projected to be reelected as South Carolina governor.
As I said, this is, this is the largest number of poll closings we're having at any one time on the clock tonight. Uh, joining us now, once again, is Steve Kornacki to look at what's interesting in those races and some of the tight races where we're starting to get in more data. Yeah, an exciting hour here, certainly. It's a blank screen in Pennsylvania, but I got it up because, uh, again, we want to see here, do we get some initial, one thing that may be different from 2020 for those who remember that Pennsylvania took until Saturday at 1130. This might be it right here. Look at this. Allegheny County, one of the bi second biggest in the state, where Pittsburgh is, western Pennsylvania. What you're looking at here is the mail vote from Allegheny County, and this is just about all of it. And they just counted it up and released it all out in one batch at the start of the night. I was saying what might be different from 2020, this might be different. We might get a lot more of the mail vote early in the night. And again, remember the pattern in 2020 in Pennsylvania was that we weren't getting much of the mail vote on election night or early in election night. We were getting largely same day vote heavily from Republican counties. And Joe Biden spent the week getting mail votes counted up in one county after the other and eventually taking the lead and winning the state. Well, this is now different. Now you've got 150,000 plus mail ballots just released from one of the biggest Democratic counties in the state, Allegheny County, Western Pennsylvania. John Fetterman, of course, a mayor uh, from Braddock, Pennsylvania, right in the area, 84% of that mail vote. Now, remember, this dynamic of different voting modes having wildly different results is more pronounced and more extreme in Pennsylvania than just about any other state because most other states have a middle ground. Most states have the mail-in vote and then the same-day vote and also the early vote. There's no early vote in Pennsylvania. You either mail in your ballot or you vote same day. And the folks who vote by mail, this is how heavily Democratic they are. I can just give you a, a sense of this. Overall, this is a Democratic county, but it was Biden with 60%. Fetterman's running almost 25 points above that number because we're looking at mail and ballots. So now, in a county like Allegheny, and if we see this happen in other counties in Pennsylvania, the story is going to be that same day vote. How much does that Fetterman number come down as the same day vote? which we would expect to be pretty strongly Republican, how much does that Fetterman number come down? Remember, Joe Biden won Pennsylvania statewide by 80,000 votes. So Fetterman essentially wants, in every given county where we call up the numbers like this, Fetterman wants to basically be at that Biden number. He could maybe afford to be a fraction of a point lower than it, you know, give or take. So in Allegheny, that's what we're going to be looking for the rest of tonight as the same day vote gets counted. It may take a while to start getting that same day. In. We're also keeping an eye on Philadelphia County, the other biggie in the state, in the state, the other end of the state. Are they going to release? They, they talked about releasing uh, today publicly about a hundred thousand mail-in votes pretty quickly right off the bat. So that's why I'm keeping an eye on. We may see a big batch of Democratic votes. Keep in mind the mail votes that you get out of Philadelphia. If they do have that hundred thousand, they talked about releasing uh, shortly after poll closing. That wouldn't be all of them. There was that procedural change. If you followed today. Uh, under the threat of litigation, there'd be about 20 or 30,000 mail in ballots still to come after that. But again, there's the potential here in the next few minutes. There's the potential here for another 100,000 or so mail-in ballots to be reported out of Philadelphia. So we may be in a situation here. We'll see what else lights up in Pennsylvania. But we may be in a situation where, me, where a John Fetterman banks a pretty significant advantage in this running tally here. And then the story really becomes, you know, the same-day vote elsewhere. Is that going to be enough for Mehmet Oz uh, to overcome it? Kind of a reverse uh, of how it all played out in 2020. So let's see. Can you keep it a close eye there on, uh, on Pennsylvania uh, and I, I, they're going to shout to me in my ear if we get Philadelphia. I promise you I'll go straight back to it if we do. Um, wanted to update you on Florida where you see, obviously, Rubio and uh, uh, DeSantis declared winners in the gubernatorial race. The other thing we're tracking in Florida, though, House seats. And, and again, just to update you here, uh, now it's been projected in the 13th district. Anna Paulina Luna has been projected by NBC to be the winner of this House race. And you see the gain. This is a gain for Republicans. This was the seat that was held by Charlie Crist. It was redrawn at the insistence of Governor DeSantis uh, to favor Republicans. Uh, in light of that, perhaps Chris chose to run for governor this year. Anna Paulina Luna, the Republican, picks it up. Republicans need a net gain, net gain of five seats to get the House. There's a gain for them right there. Here's another 
another one. This district was drawn. This is the newly created district in Florida. They gained a seat because of redistricting. It was drawn to favor Republicans. The Republicans win it. That's a gain for Republicans right there. Uh, you take a look at the, uh, uh, here it is, the, uh, the fourth district. Again, this was a, a district that was represented by Al Lawson, Democratic congressman. This was a heavily Democratic district. The lines were dramatically redrawn uh, to favor Republicans. And here it is. The Republican candidate, Aaron Bean, has won. That is a gain, a gain, a net gain for Republicans. The purpose of this map that Ron DeSantis pushed through politically was to help Republicans along toward that goal of getting five seats in the House. And I just showed you three districts that Republicans have now picked up seats in Florida. Um, one other state here that I have neglected a bit, and I don't want to neglect any further, it's New Hampshire. We've neglected it a bit because it's a very slow count. We were hoping it'd be a little quicker here in New Hampshire. So it's a scattered. You got some vote from, oh, we just got Philadelphia. I'll come back to New Hampshire, I promise. No offense <laughs> to the Granite Staters, but <laughs> here we go. Here's Philadelphia. And what we got here is, yeah, so it's just about 61,000. They were telling us 100,000. Uh, but we've got here uh, a little, uh, about 62, 63,000 male votes reported out here, though. But again, you can, I mean, look, this is a 55,000 net gain here for John Fetterman, male votes coming out of Philadelphia. So you've got the two biggest counties in the state, Philadelphia. Philadelphia and Allegheny. And we know in Philadelphia there are tens of thousands of mail-in votes that are still to come, but they're going to look like this. They're going to be hugely advantageous to the Democrats. So with only that counted right now, this is what the statewide vote looks like in Pennsylvania. It's an advantage starting out of over 160,000 votes for Fetterman over Oz. Still to come will be the same day vote in Allegheny, the same day vote in Philadelphia. We're going to get mail from all the other counties in the state plus the same day. But again, and it's just with these with counties this big reporting out this much mail vote that favors the Democrat by this margin. I think it sets the stage again, the storyline we're going to be following tonight for those who remember the 2020 election in Pennsylvania may well be the reverse. I think the storyline tonight might be is Oz on the strength of same day vote able to catch up with Fetterman who gets, again, the reports, the early mail reports that we didn't see in 2020. So Steve, it's a different can, I'm sorry to interrupt you just for a call. Yeah. Um, it's in the New Hampshire governor's race. I would only interrupt you for this purpose. Uh, the New Hampshire governor's race, we have a projected winner. Republican incumbent Chris Sununu is the projected winner. He has been reelected in New Hampshire against his Democratic challenger, uh, Tom Sherman. Uh, sir. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. And a second call there as well. Tennessee governor's race. Uh, again, an incumbent Republican governor, this time in Tennessee. Bill Lee is projected to be reelected against his uh, Democratic challenger, Jason Martin. Again, so that's calls both in the Tennessee governor's race uh, and in the New Hampshire governor's race. Two Republican incumbents there holding on to their seats. Steve, I'm sorry to have interrupted. I know you're about to talk about New Hampshire anyway. It was a great segue. <laughs> so, so here we go. And, and it's, it's limited in terms of what's in New Hampshire. I'll, I'll start on the governor race because you could see what's limited is coming in and it's it's more democratic than republican and sunun is doing so well in it that he actually trails in the tally but he's overperforming what republican thresholds are in some of these areas so much that's what the call comes from but i think that's interesting in terms of just taking an initial look at this senate race because this senate race is one maggie hassan's running for re-election in 2016 she won in a squeaker in new hampshire and in 2016 new hampshire nearly went for trump the margin was just a couple thousand votes that Hillary Clinton won the state by. It then swung towards Biden by seven points in 2020. And then this Senate race, sort of in the last couple of weeks, has been a bit of a mystery. National Republicans thought that Bullock was a sure loser in this race, and they started seeing polling that this is, might be close, might be competitive. Okay, it's very early. Again, these are disproportionately Democratic areas that are reporting. But I want to show you, we have three places where we do think, it's, again, these are all cities and towns, so these are not as big as counties that you see in other states generally. But I do want to show you, because there, there might be a, the start of a trend? There might be. Let's take a look. Littleton, New Hampshire. We, we think we have basically all the vote counted here. Hassan beating Bolduc in Littleton 50 to 46. Two things that I think are noteworthy about that. Number one, that is right on the Biden number for Hassan. In fact, it's a little bit ahead of it. And Biden, remember, won the state by seven. So if you're Don Bolduc, you want to be overperforming Donald Trump in any given city or town in New Hampshire. And in fact, Bolduc is actually slightly 
underperforming Trump in Littleton. And it's a big contrast as well with the governor's race. Look at this, Sununu right. is romping right. in Littleton. So, you know, Littleton's an example. New Ipswich, small town here right on the Massachusetts border. But again, you see Sununu is romping. You take a look at the Senate race. Boldick actually is too, but if you take a look, Trump got 67% here. Boldick needs to be running, you know, four, four, five, six points ahead of Trump. He's probably got to do a little bit better than that in a place like New Ipswich. And then you take a look at New Market, New Hampshire. And again, we think it's all in here. There's a lot of small towns. But again, Biden 65.8 in 2020. Hassan is going to do a couple points better than Joe Biden did here. And again, Boldick has got to be outperforming Trump. So these are very early returns here, but you're seeing a gap between Boldick and, and then Republican Governor Chris Sununu. We knew there'd be a gap. Sununu was heavily favored in this race. But that's what we're going to be looking for as more of these cities and towns report in New Hampshire. Is Boldick outperforming Trump? We've got three cities and towns, with, well, towns, with complete results. And so far, he's not in any of them. There's a lot more to come, but that's what we're going to be looking for uh, as the night progresses. And by the way, we're just, just uh, we did get a little bit more here uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and again, what you're seeing here is mail vote. So again, Cumberland County, now you're right outside of Harrisburg here. And you see Fetterman was 74%. This is a place where you know, Trump carried the county. Biden only got 44%. But you're seeing mail vote get reported out much earlier this time around than in 2020. And I'm just seeing same thing here. Clinton County this is a small county, but the same story. Warren County, same story. So it, 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 this is mail voting was brand new in Pennsylvania in 2020. They were flooded with ballots because of the pandemic. A lot of counties just didn't know how to handle it. And I think what you're seeing here is some counties have made adjustments here to get it reported out much faster. So again, you now see Fetterman, you know, with an advantage there of about 177,000 votes over us. Obviously, very early. This is all on the strength of mail-in ballots. So the story is going to become in Pennsylvania you know, same-day vote. Is there going to be enough same-day vote for Mehmet Oz uh, to catch up with John Fetterman? I wanted to update you. We're talking about House races too, the gains that Republicans made in Florida. We also talked about the three districts that Republicans are. Targeting targeting in Virginia. And I wanted to update you first on the 10th district outside of Washington, D.C. And you could see when we looked at this earlier, the Republican had the advantage. It's now flipped around. What happened is Loudoun County, we got numbers out of Loudoun County to put the Democratic incumbent Jennifer Wexton ahead. Again here, more than 70 percent of the vote is in. If Wexton wins, Democrats obviously are happy, but Democrats want to see this number get much bigger with the remaining vote in the 10th district, because this was an 18-point Biden district. Uh, you know, if, if, if Cow is able to, you know, keep this in single digits, in, in mid-low single digits even, you know, Republicans would take that as a good sign nationally for them. We've got even more of the vote in in the 7th district here. This is where Abigail Spanberger, the two-term Democrats, being challenged by Yesley Vega. You could see Spanberger now, as more vote has come in, uh, more of the early vote has been processed, is inching up here, but uh, still is, is trailing in the count. And continuing now with more than 50 percent of the vote in, this might be getting a little scary for Democrats in the second district here down by Virginia Beach. Jen Kiggins, the Republican, you know, continuing with that advantage over Elaine Lurie, the Democrat. Again, there's, there's sort of three tiers here, these three districts I'm showing you. Sort of on, an, on a decent night nationally for Republicans, they expected to win the second. On a good night, they expected to get the seventh too. And on a fantastic night, they talked about winning something like the 10th district. So give you a sense of kind of the tiers of expectation that are set by those three districts. Uh, but that's where it's stands at Virginia right now, and I'm just checking back. Uh, in, in, I'll land on Georgia and just see where the Senate race stands. Steve, I want to tell you, I'm going to ask you in a second to check in on North Carolina Senate, too, after we yeah. get Georgia here. Yeah, it's just, again, statewide here in Georgia, we're getting a lot of the Atlanta metro area in. You can see in these counties what's happening here. I, I mentioned this at the beginning. You've got mail vote, you've got early vote, and that's a lot of these counties are releasing that first. They're not all releasing all of it. <laughs> what we're finding out as this comes in, as I said, this is the first time this is being done like this in Georgia. Some are releasing just the mail. Some are releasing just the early. Some are releasing uh, both. But you are seeing, you know, uh, the Democrats bank pretty big advantages, especially in these big counties immediately in the uh, Atlanta area. But one thing to keep an eye on, if you look at the statewide numbers here, I think one thing to keep an eye on here is the gap between Warnock in the Senate race and Stacey Abrams in the governor's race. So you got Warnock running 
running statewide right now with 53.8 percent. Same ballots, same number of ballots uh, coming from the same places in the governor's race, and you see Abrams is running about three points behind that. Another way of looking at it is Kemp is running about three points ahead. Of that. You get about a three-point gap between the Senate race and the governor's race in Georgia uh, right now. Uh, but again, a lot of this is the strength right now. This Democrat, the Democratic advantage you're seeing, uh, a lot of that early mail vote, especially in the Atlanta area, though we are getting a lot of rural vote in too. Uh, one county, by the way, this is one, I, I think this is going to be key, actually. We, we might as well flag it. I'll put the Senate race up right here. And notice there's a, about a six or seven point gap here between uh, a Kemp and Herschel Walker in Cherokee County. This is one of the biggest Republican plurality uh, producing counties in the United States of America. Cherokee County, you're getting north of Atlanta here. Now, Donald Trump got won this by about 40 points, close to 40 points in 2020. But that was actually, that's not up to par with how Republicans used to do in Cherokee. Take a look at this. Trump got 72% in 2016, and you go back to 2012, Republicans used to win close to 80% here. So this is, one of, this is one of the reasons why Joe Biden was able to win Georgia in 2020. He got blown out in Cherokee County, but he didn't get blown out like Democrats used to get blown out. And so I think this is an interesting number to keep an eye on as the rest of the vote comes in from Cherokee. Is Herschel Walker able to get past that Trump 2020 number? That's what he's got to do, because Trump it wasn't enough for Trump to win the state. Walker's got to get past that, that, uh, that Trump number. You can see already in Cherokee County, Brian Kemp is past that number. Um, you had asked about North Carolina, so I'll just put that right up on the screen here, and we can see now more than half the vote is in in North Carolina. Sherry Beasley continuing to lead the tally. Bud continuing to get closer. It's now in to inside 10 points. It's now single digits. What's happening again is the same day vote is beginning to get added in in a lot of these counties that initially reported out. So let's just take a look here that initially reported out. So it's now down to an 8.3 percent margin. Let's take a look at some of these. We got Mecklenburg County. I don't think much has changed there since. Since we last look, let's look at Union County next door here. So Union County, Union County is a bit like Cherokee County that I was just telling you about in Georgia. You're right outside of Charlotte, kind of a core Republican county, but Donald Trump kind of underperformed in 2020. So remember, Trump won the state in 2020 by 75,000 votes barely. So this is a this is the kind of county here where Ted Budd he wants to be running ahead of this Trump number. On the strength of the mail and the early vote, that's basically what you're looking at in Union, he's at 59. So the question is, when the same day is added, can he exceed that 61.4? If he does, that's a very good sign for Bud. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good sign um, uh, for him statewide. I'm just looking at a couple other places. Wake County, again, we're about where we were. But, but it's, yeah, the question here in North Carolina is same day vote largely uh, for Bud. Is it going to be enough to lift him past Beasley? Before we move on to anything else, I need to tell you that we do have a projection to make uh, in the Massachusetts governor's race. The Democrat, Moore Healy, is the projected winner in Massachusetts. This is a pickup for the Democratic Party in terms of governor's races. Uh, the previous Republican governor uh, elected not to run for re-election. He did not. Um, it, Jeff Deal was the Republican challenger here. Uh, Moore Healy, neither of these is an incumbent, but this is a pickup for the Democrats in the Massachusetts governor's race. Chris, Chris Hayes, go ahead. Oh, I just <clears throat> I wanted to uh, just mention we're going to go back to New Hampshire looking at those early numbers. Again, another one of those comparisons, right? And it's incumbent, not incumbent. So that does something. But whether you've got Kemp and Herschel Walker, you've got Kemp running ahead of Walker, six, seven points, it looks like right now, uh, five or six points. Bulldog, Chris Sununu. They desperately wanted Sununu to run for that Senate race. He's very popular. He's, I think we've projected him as a winner tonight. Again, he's called Trump nuts. He disassociated him. He, you know, disavowed all the election denialism. He's going to run considerably higher than Bulldog. Like, one of the themes that we're seeing in the early data here is that there is a tax on your general election popularity of being the MAGA candidate. And, and Kemp, that Kemp is a great story in that vein, too. I mean, Kemp is as sort of culpable and liable for the voter suppression laws that have been voted in, predicated on the big lie, of which Kemp certified there was no fraud in Georgia. Right. Um, but Kemp is running ahead of Herschel Walker, and Kemp was in a primary against a MAGA candidate yep. and beat him. We have one more call that we need to make, which has just happened just in the last second. If we can put that up on the screen, NBC News can now project that in Vermont, uh, the projected winner in the Vermont Senate race is Democrat Peter Welch. 
Um, again, we also just had a call in the Massachusetts governor's race. Uh, this is the Senate at this hour. Democrats now with that Peter Welch victory in Vermont, holding 37 seats in the Senate. Republicans holding 36, 27 seats still undecided. All right, we're going to take a quick breath. We've got another set of poll, comings, uh, poll closings coming up in uh, six minutes. We'll be right back with that after this. Stay with us. Just coming up on 8.30 Eastern right now, this is the status of the Pennsylvania Senate race. It's too early to call between Democrat John Fetterman and Republican Mehmet Oz. Uh, we're also looking at an Ohio Senate race uh, that is similarly characterized as too early to call between Democrat Tim Ryan uh, and J.D. Vance. I do have one interesting House race to tell you about uh, in Florida's 10th District. We're highlighting this race because Maxwell Frost is the projected winner here. He's the Democrat in this race. He's 25 years old. He is the first representative of Gen Z uh, to be elected to the United States Congress. He is 25, which means he was born in 1997, <laughs> which I think is mathematically impossible. It is. Uh, actually, you, literally. You, 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 you did not do that math right. I think no, you messed it up. No, I didn't do that math right. No. No, but 81. You did. I, I literally, you did. I'm joking. I literally have liquor older than him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't go bad. He's got a great story. He's a he's a march for, he's a march for our lives mm -hmm. guy who yeah. got you know radicalized by the by the Stoneman uh, Douglas shooting and um, he's he's an incredible kid and, and, get, and, and young man. Well, and in an age of, of malaise and feelings like people have given up on the system, they, obviously there's another generation right behind. At 8:30 p.m. Eastern, we have just had one big poll closing in the great state of Arkansas. Uh, we've got a Senate race and a governor's race in Arkansas that we have been watching. And the NBC News election desk tells us at this hour, it is too early to call between incumbent Republican John Boozman and his Democratic challenger, Natalie James, although Boozman leads. And in the Arkansas governor's race, uh, that race is also characterized at this hour as too early to call although Republican Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, is leading in this race against Democrat Chris Jones. This, of course, would be Sarah Huckabee Sanders taking the governorship of Arkansas, a job previously held uh, by her father, Mike Huckabee, uh, which is an unusual succession in American politics. But these things do happen. Not that unusual. I mean, Not father, unusual. father to daughter in the father, same yeah, governor? Sure. I don't yeah. know. Can don't we know. just talk about Maxwell Frost, though, again? I mean, it, <laughs> just for a second, because he, He's, he yeah. just, we just, I just interviewed him when we were down in Orlando, and he actually experienced you know, gun violence in, in his own life in Orlando. And it's just this really dynamic young kid. He's going to be succeeding Val Demings um, in the United States Senate. He's going to be representing that same um, in Orlando house. area uh, in the House. And, and, you know, he is kind of the hope for what you could eventually develop in a state like Florida. I know Democrats are very hard to let go of Florida. They don't want to let it go. But he is one of those young activists in the state um, that is galvanizing around the issue of gun violence in a way that you're seeing that generation do. And that whole, you know, march for our lives, those kids, they really are the future. If there ever is a time when Florida will matriculate back to being sort of a normal political state and not just a far, far, far right state, which I think that's what it is right now, that generation will, will take them there. If you want to get the issues of climate change and gun violence to be national issues, a whole generation leading on, he is an avatar of yeah, that generation, yeah. especially is. coming from Florida, right? Yeah, this is how absolutely. you get those issues back to the top of the conversation. Yeah. Steve, coming out of the break here, we took a quick look at the status of the Pennsylvania Senate race and the Ohio Senate race. Obviously, the eyes of the country are on both those races, the Georgia Senate race as well. What can you tell us in terms of an update? Yeah, I mean, again, the story here in Pennsylvania, with one exception right now, is, is that you're seeing mail vote get reported out here first in a lot of these places, accounting for that uh, significant advantage that Fetterman has Natalia on your screen. You do see one Republican area reporting out here and, and Oz getting the uh, uh, getting the jump. So it's not all going to come in that order. But this is this is the kind of pattern that Oz is going to need in a county like this. Uh, he's going to need same day vote to come in huge for him, you know, to offset this. One thing we're seeing is relative also seeing is that relative to 20. 20, you know, Fetterman is running in the mail vote pretty much as strong as Joe Biden did. Uh, it may be a difference of a few points, but there is going to be, it looks like, a lower share of mail votes. It's going to account for a lower share of overall votes, at least if what we're seeing out of Allegheny is any indication. 
So that does raise one possibility as the same day vote starts to get tabulated in Pennsylvania. There will still be a massive gap between the mail vote and the same day vote. But given how Democratic the mail vote was in 20 and still is in 22, if there's fewer people choosing to vote by mail and they're voting same day instead, that same day pool may end up being less Republican, less strongly Republican than we saw in 2020. So if you're factoring in 2020 numbers along those lines, may have to adjust it just at least based on what we're seeing out of Allegheny County. Um, checking in next door in Ohio, again, you know, about a third, a little bit less than a third of the vote in here right now. Again, primarily male early vote. So we said that would give Tim Ryan the advantage. The question would be, could same day offset it for Vance? There's two key, there's three key House races uh, in Ohio here as we talk about the battle for the House. And let me just take you through those. Number one is right here in the Toledo area. And this is Marcy Kaptur. She's been in the House for 40 years, a Democrat, and redistricting dramatically, dramatically changed her district. Look at this. Under the redrawn lines, this is actually a Trump district. And her opponent here, J.R. Majewski, drawn all sorts of uh, controversy claims about his military service, uh, 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 really kind of marring his campaign, national Republicans and like uh, kind of walking away from him. You see a huge lead here for Captor, but again, just to light up the counties in the district here, you're looking at mail and early vote. So let's see what happens as the same day comes in in this district. But Captor running in hostile territory. She was thought to be in, she could still be in trouble, but at the start of the year when the lines were redrawn, it was thought to be potentially the end of her career. Is Majewski just a step too far for the voters in the district that went for Trump by three points? Democrats, you're getting some bad news in Florida earlier. They badly need Captor to hang on here in the ninth. Another interesting house race in Ohio is down in the Cincinnati area. Now here's Steve Shabbat a longtime Republican incumbent, he also got a raw deal in redistricting, just like Captor did. The, the lines in this district changed dramatically. It's anchored in Cincinnati now. This is a Cincinnati a city councilman, Greg Landsman, who's running against Shabbat. This is a Biden plus eight district that a long-serving Republican is trying to get reelected in. Again, you're looking at mail early vote here, so you're looking at kind of the high watermark for Landsman, but Shabbat, to get to 50% and actually win this, he's facing a real challenge here. And this is key for Democrats, because again, Republicans need a net gain of five seats to get the House. We just showed you that map that was drawn in Florida and that Republicans were doing everything that they were hoping to do out of it. This would be a net gain for Democrats. If Landsman beats Shabbat, you'll see a net gain indicator next to Landsman's name. That's how Democrats could offset. That's what they need to offset Republican gains like we saw in Florida earlier. Because if we zoom out here and take kind of a big picture look at it, we've arranged the districts nationally this way. This is sort of the lowest hanging fruit for, uh, for Republicans. The these are Democratic seats, right, that were won by Trump in 2020. And already we showed you in Florida, they took three of them. Those are three gains for them. So, you know, in the ninth district of Ohio that I just showed you with Marcy Kaptur would be another. Continuing on this list, the polls are closed in Tennessee. The fifth district of Tennessee, this is another case where the map was dramatically redrawn. Jim Cooper, a long serving, like three decade Democratic incumbent, used to represent the fifth district. The lines were changed so dramatically that it became a Trump double-digit district. He announced his retirement. You see in the early returns, there's expectation of a Republican victory here. And you see in the early returns, the Republican far ahead. That could be a Republican gain. Similar story in Georgia, the 6th District of Georgia. Lucy McBath, a Democrat, used to represent the 6th District. In the redistricting, it got merged with the 7th District. Two Democrats were sort of forced into the same district. McBath won that primary. She's running tonight. But the 6th District was changed into a Republican plus 15, Trump by 15 district. As a result, you see now more than a quarter of vote in the Republican with a double digit advantage in the sixth district. So you see these potential for Republican gains. A lot of these just because of the, 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 the way the map was reconfigured. Democrats need something like that Cincinnati seat to start offsetting this. I want to update us on we've got another call i have to tell you in the governor's race in the great state of vermont we have a projection the republican governor of vermont phil scott uh, the incumbent governor has been re-elected that's a new projection in the vermont governor's race he's defeated his democratic challenger brenda siegel we're going to sneak in a quick break here um, just to keep you in in keep you in the loop in terms of what we are heading toward nine o'clock poll closings in lots of the most closely watched states 
rates in the country. At the top of this hour, we're looking at poll closings in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Arizona, Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Mexico, New York, North Dakota, South Dakota, Texas, Wyoming. That's all coming up in less than a half an hour. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We have a new call in a new race. This is the Rhode Island governor's race. NBC News election desk can now project that the incumbent Democratic governor of Rhode Island, Dan McKee, has been reelected against his Republican challenger, Ashley Kalis. Again, Rhode Island governor, that is a Democratic hold for that governor's race. Now, as I mentioned before the break, one of the important poll, poll closings that we are heading toward about a quarter hour from now, at the top of the hour, 9 o'clock Eastern time, is the great state of Arizona. And one of the things we've been watching over the course of the day is the far right and the Trumpist wing of the Republican Party focusing on Arizona. Uh, in, I guess, this year's iteration of election denialism stuff. Uh, joining us now is Ben Collins. He's a senior reporter for NBC News. He focuses on the Internet and disinformation and extremism. And, Ben, I know you've been keeping an eye on this today. Yeah, look, uh, in the Bannon sphere, in the Steve Bannon world, uh, this is the big thing in Arizona. Um, you, uh, he has had pretty much every person in that coterie on his program tonight. The My Pillow guy, Mike Lindell, uh, Roger Stone, Charlie Kirk, who runs Turning Point USA. And they're all pointing specifically to Arizona. They say there's problems with all of these things. All day long, they've been pushing this since really early in the morning. They've said, you know, they had videos of, of people saying uh, that a, a specific uh, tabulation box is really a shredder and all these things, really uh, wild stuff. Um, but it is appearing over the course of the night, this is sort of their firewall. This is where um, if they lose a series of states, this might be their last uh, real place uh, to cause some chaos, cause some mayhem. Uh, and they're doing that with lots of weird viral tricks on the internet right now uh, on Steve Bannon's show. Ben, disinformation and misinformation are two different things, right? Yep. One is uh, when you just get something wrong, and the other one is when you deliberately get something wrong or, in fact, create something out of whole cloth and try to sell it as if it's true. Are we seeing wholly invented um, uh, fake news, wholly invented uh, false stories about Arizona, or are they just spinning and distorting what amount to small kind of normal distortions in the, in the electoral process over the course of the day into something that seems more nefarious than it is. Yeah, it's the second thing, Rachel. Um, you know, with this stuff, they take a grain of truth, which is, you know, there were a couple of uh, vote tabulation boxes that were uh, malfunctioning, and they took a video of a person announcing this to the group. They say basically, you know, just wait in line uh, or put it in that third box, and we'll deal with it later. They will be adjudicated. They will be hand counted at the end of the day. Uh, but that wasn't enough for some people on the internet who had to then wildly. Um, hypothesize about what was really going on with the ballots because that's what goes on in this space. You got to remember the backdrop of this, Rachel, which is that there is this very big documentary in the pro Trump internet called, uh, by the way, we should put documentary in quotes there. There is a film called 2000 <laughs> Mules uh, by Dinesh D'Souza uh, that alleges very ridiculously that there are what he calls mules, people dropping off things into ballot boxes and all of these things, uh, fake votes all throughout the country. Uh, it's been widely and continuously discredited and debunked. A good one from this weekend was from John Oliver, if you want to watch one of those. Uh, you know, I, that is really taken hold in, a, in an underground way on the pro-Trump Internet. And people have just been looking around for really anything funny that happened or any, uh, any small thing that could be blown, blown out of proportion. Uh, and that's exactly that's exactly what's happening in Arizona. Let me ask you one last question on this, Ben, and that is when we talk about stuff like this being focused on Arizona, uh, because of our experience there in 2020 and what we saw outside some of the big counting sites in Arizona, one of the things we have to think about is the fact that Arizona is an open carry state and a lot of the far right in Arizona has been willing to use their open carry privilege uh, as a form of um, uh, political intimidation. So I have to ask if any of the discussions that you're seeing about this, as you described in the Bannon sphere and the sort of Trump wing of the internet and, and that part of social media, whether they are asking for in real life protests, whether they are asking for people to go physically go to a place or do a thing, uh, given what they are hypothesizing and distorting about Arizona's election tonight. Yeah, Rachel, it, you know, in the weeks before this, they were literally surrounding ballot drop boxes at the request of people associated 
associated with Steve Bannon, uh, people going on his show saying uh, that we need mule watchers. We need people to watch these ballot drop boxes. And some people did show up in fatigues outside of these ballot drop boxes as an effort to shoo away people or intimidate people outside of polls. So that was that effort. And now, you know, Steve Bannon is not, he, he knows where the line is. You know, these people consistently know what's legal and what's not legal to say in the moment. Uh, but you, if you go to the extremist forums, places like the Donald, where January 6th was planned uh, on the Internet, they talk about how voting doesn't even matter. You should just, you know, this is going to come down to weapons anyway. So that is the worry, is that once those people in those spaces get the message uh, from Steve Bannon that something is afoot, they can take it from there. Ben Collins, uh, NBC News senior reporter on the disinformation and extremism beat, and uh, invaluable. And please, you know, basically keep my number. Um, as you're watching this stuff happens and you think there's things that we need to be letting people know about as we're watching election results come in, interrupt us. Let us know what's happening. What you're doing tonight is really important. You know, Thanks, Rachel, thank you. Uh, I mean, Arizona is Trump's white whale. I mean, Arizona, Arizona, Arizona is Trump's mantra, and there's no one more subservient to Trump's message about the lie than Carrie Lake. So the fact that Arizona is already the epicenter of the big lie 2022 is not an accident. The again, cyber ninjas aren't right. coming to get him this time. Right. But, but again, as, as, as January 6th committee presented all the evidence, it was like, oh, yeah, they did all that in public. Yeah. As we're covering Arizona yeah. tonight, they've done it all in public. And remember, this was the state that freaked him out because it was called first. It was the first state that sort of shocked him. Uh, by the Fox News by decision the Fox desk, News which freaked him out desk, all the more. Which freaked him out all the more. It's also, I think, the important point that Ben just made. This is an open carry state. This is the state where people are watching bo drop boxes fully armed. Um, and it's the state, I think, where the information universe is the most potent because Carrie Lake on down that entire ticket are election deniers each one more extreme than the last that's right and I, what I'm just I just was quickly looking at just looking into the transcripts of some of the things Carrie Lake is saying tonight they are panicking you don't panic like that if you feel you're in a position of strength in terms of the actual election we should also note I mean you said this before the Maricopa County Board of Elections who conducted themselves admirably I think at least from what I can tell not being in Maricopa County it's a it's, they're Republicans and they yeah. had to stand yes. up in 2020 against all this. They yeah. had the, I mean, we covered on our air. I remember sitting at this desk, no, well, a different desk, but this <laughs> one, uh, in 2020 with all those, that crazy scene outside their yes. offices. That That's was right. that Alex Jones, I think, was there Yeah. right away. I mean, there was a wild scene outside there. I saw them today. They had the camp, local news, they invited local news to watch them tabulate early the absentee ballots. I mean, they have really conducted themselves, from, from what I can tell, again, with integrity and transparency, and they have been gunned for yes. by the and remember Bannon the cyber, and and remember the not, cyber ninjas? We should yeah, not forget. forget. I mean, I went to Wisconsin to talk to some of these election officials. The level of security they now have yeah. to have in place. In Arizona, they have plastic jersey barriers, plastic big plastic barriers around the elections office. They have plain clothes police officers. They said they were going to have them at every polling site. I mean, this is the harvest, right, of, yeah. of the, the seeds sown by Trump. And if you are elections. wondering how all those, as Joy put it, those election deniers from the top to the bottom of the ballot in Arizona are doing, we don't know yet because polls are still open. Polls are still open in Arizona. They close in about 10 minutes. And so we're going to take a quick break here so we can come back, get you those poll closings right at the top of the hour. We've got a lot more still to get to. The night is young. Stay with us. Arkansas U.S. Senate race incumbent Republican John Boozman has won. He has been reelected against his Democratic challenger, Natalie James. Again, that's the Arkansas Senate race. Uh, Senator Boozman reelected. This is the status of the U.S. Senate at this hour. Both parties holding 37 seats. There are 26 seats still undecided, as is the overall control of the United States Senate. Steve Kornacki, we're coming up on 9 o'clock poll closings, but before we get there, do you have an update on the New Hampshire Senate race? Yeah, and again, it's the vote count is coming in slow, but we got 20% now, and these are all the individual cities and towns. What we're doing is we're just taking the ones that are completed, and we're comparing them to the 2020 presidential result to get a sense. So I think we, getting a, Concord is a good example. 
example, this is the third largest city in New Hampshire, obviously the state capital. We think all the vote is in and conquered. So Maggie Hassan is a Democratic city. No surprise she's winning, but compare it to 2020. Mm -hmm. Remember, Donald Trump lost this state by seven points. He got 45% of the vote. If you're Don Bolduc, you need to be running on average five plus points better than Trump in any given city or town. He's running three points behind Trump in Concord. We showed you this in some other places earlier. Let's go over to Rochester here. Again, Trump actually carried Rochester. We think the votes are all in in Rochester. Bolduc, a fraction of a point under Trump. Go to a Republican area, small, small town here, Ossipee. But again, Trump won it, all in. Bolduc, short of the Trump number. He's got to be doing better than this. The wild card in New Hampshire remains these towns right along the Massachusetts line. These are the, some of the most large, uh, largely densely populated, largest densely populated towns in New Hampshire. A lot of them traditionally Republican. A lot of them still voted for Trump. So you got to see if Bolduc can run up some big numbers there, but he's not getting what he wants so far out of New Hampshire. That's also good news for the Democratic Congressman Chris Pappas, who represents the eastern half of the state. I'm looking at the clock to make sure I don't go over the nine o'clock poll closings because I know we got some big ones but I did want to update you on those three critical house races in Virginia and let's just tick through them again three Republican targets here this is the second district near Virginia Beach we've got more than three quarters of the vote in right now Elaine Luria definitely in trouble against Jen Kiggins the Republican challenger there would be a Republican pickup if she gets it seventh district it says 99 percent is in that that estimate is actually a little off and you could just see that came down a little bit the, the confusion the confusion here is this the 7th district and the 10th district just north of it they share Prince William County and so what's what's happening here in the 7th district is you see it's the big blue area there's a lot of vote to come in Prince William County, and it's absentee vote. So it's going to be heavily Democratic. And there's also this little independent city you see here, geographically little, is Fredericksburg. There's absentee vote to come from Fredericksburg as well. So there's big opportunities remaining on the board for Spanberger to erase that deficit. It says 99%, but I just showed you where the vote can still come in. And so there's an opportunity there, certainly, for her to make up that 5,800 vote deficit. And in the 10th district, again, Wexton by six points here, but again, they share Prince William County. So Wexton already ahead by six. There will be more votes. They will be absentee. They will be from Prince William County. So I think Democrats feeling good about 10. They feel optimistic about the seventh, but they are in trouble in that second district in Virginia right now. Briefly, Steve, do you have time to check in on the Kentucky abortion ban? Yeah, let's call it. possible for you to do that? Let's call it up. The nine? vote's been very slow in Kentucky, but here it is. Uh, a quarter of the vote is in in Kentucky right now, and it's failing at the moment, but it's close. It's 53-47. I'm just looking at where the vote is coming in from here. Uh, big Democratic county, Fayette County, we don't have anything in from yet. No uh, is a vote against the abortion ban. Yes is a vote for the abortion ban. Correct. Okay. All right. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry to be abrupt there, but <laughs> we've got a poll closing right now, a whole raft of them um, at 9 o'clock. Obviously, big, big Senate race is still outstanding. Georgia Senate. Senate, Pennsylvania Senate, Ohio Senate, but one of the other big ones we are watching for is in Arizona, and that is one of the races that in which uh, in a state in which polls have just closed. So at this hour, at nine o'clock Eastern, this is what we've got in the Arizona Senate race. It is too early to call between Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly and his Republican challenger Blake Masters. Too early to call in Arizona Senate. In the Wisconsin Senate race, incumbent Republican Ron Johnson. Too early to call against his Democratic challenger. Mandela Barnes. In the New York Senate race, the Democratic Senate leader Charles Schumer is the projected winner. Charles Schumer projected to be reelected, as is Kansas Republican Senator Jerry Moran. In the South Dakota Senate race, John Thune, senior member of the Republican leadership in the U.S. Senate, projected to be reelected tonight. In the Colorado Senate race, incumbent Democrat Michael Bennett, too early to call against his Republican challenger Joe O'Day. In in Iowa, in the Iowa Senate race, Chuck Grassley, the incumbent Republican, too early to call against his Democratic challenger, Michael Franken. In the Louisiana Senate race, incumbent Republican John Kennedy, too early to call against his Democratic challenger, Gary Chambers. In the North Dakota Senate race, this is too early to call, but incumbent Republican John Hoven is in the lead against his Democratic challenger. 
This is the overall state of the Senate at this hour. Democrats holding 38 seats, Republicans holding 39, 23, seat, 23 seats still undecided. Now let's have a look at some of the governor's races this hour. Again, with 9 p.m. poll closings in the Arizona governor's race, it is too early to call between Democrat Katie Hobbs and Republican Carrie Lake. In the New York governor's race, it is too early to call between incumbent Democrat Kathy Hochul and her Republican challenger Lee Zeldin. In the Texas governor's race, incumbent Republican Greg Abbott is in the lead, although it is too early to call between him and Democrat Beto O'Rourke. In the Wisconsin governor's race, it is Democratic incumbent Tony Evers against Republican Tim Michaels. That is too early to call in Wisconsin governor's race. In the Colorado governor's race, it is a Democratic incumbent. Jared Polis facing Republican Heidi Ganahl. That is too early to call in the Colorado governor's race. In the Iowa governor's race, Republican incumbent Kim Reynolds against Democrat Deidre DeGere. This is too early to call, but incumbent Republican Kim Reynolds is leading in Iowa. In the Kansas governor's race, we've got a Democratic incumbent there, Laura Kelly, who is facing Republican Derek Schmidt. That is too early to call in the Kansas governor's race. In the Michigan governor's race, Democratic incumbent Gretchen Whitmer, too early to call versus Republican challenger Tudor Dixon. In the Nebraska governor's race, it is too early to call between Republican Jim Pillen and Democrat Carol Blood. Again, New Nebraska governor, too early to call. In the New Mexico governor's race, too early to call between incumbent Democrat Michelle Luan Grisham and her Republican challenger Mark Ronchetti. In the South Dakota governor's race, it is too early to call between incumbent Republican Kristi Noem and her Democratic challenger Jamie Smith, although Governor Noem is leading in this South Dakota governor's race. And lastly, in the Wyoming governor's race, too early to call between Republican incumbent Mark Gordon and Democrat Teresa Livingston, although Republican incumbent Mark Gordon is leading in that Wyoming governor's race. Whew. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I'll breathe tomorrow. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned going into that, we are obviously, you know, every race is important, every state is important, everybody who's in these races, it's the most important thing going on in their lives. But we've got these Senate races that are so important both to the, those states and to the whole country. We don't have a resolution yet in Pennsylvania, we don't have a resolution yet in Ohio, we don't have a resolution yet in Georgia, and we don't have a resolution in Arizona. And those four are the ones that we are watching tightly. There's nothing that suggests that this isn't going to be a long night yeah. mm -hmm. uh, for all of those races, and they all have to be settled basically, yeah. before we know what's going to happen in the United States Senate, unless there's a surprise Long surprise. night. Ah, long week, maybe. Long, yeah. long, <laughs> month, right? long month, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe long sitting month. here to December. <laughs> but, you know, before we did that rundown, it was interesting to be looking at those New Hampshire Senate yeah. results. I think Republicans thought they kind of lost in the primary there. They got the candidate in Don Balduck, who they thought was not going to particularly be competitive. He's lost other races in New Hampshire before. He was kind of a late bloomer, and they thought at the end that he might have a chance about not knocking off Maggie Hassan. Obviously, this is not done yet. This is too early to call. There's only a quarter of the vote in. But what Steve was picking out in terms of bellwether communities in New Hampshire, it's looking strong for Maggie Hassan there. Sure. Well, and he's running so far behind uh, Sununu, who won kind of running away. And I yeah. think the point Chris Hayes was making all evening is that there's a real delta between people who, in, in the context of these times, are running as more normal Republicans and the MAGA candidates. They're not yeah. doing very well tonight. Which is why, and, so, and as a result of that, we're seeing something we don't normally see in modern politics, just a lot of ticket splitting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Democrats Pennsylvania, who are up. Georgia. Absolutely. Yeah, in Hampshire. Ohio, that's what yeah. Tim Ryan is counting well, on and, as well. And to consider what we should, by normal pattern, be seeing tonight, <laughs> we should be seeing a lot more clear and easy Republican wins. Mm -hmm. In a first midterm election mm -hmm. for a president, that's normally what happens. The other party picks up a lot. And New Hampshire was a place where they should have been able to pick up that Senate seat. And to, I'm occupying the Chris Hayes seat, so I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> I'm going I'm to continue to advance, advance his, his idea. The, the thing to watch here is what Donald Trump has yeah, done yeah. to the Republican Party. Created uh, some candidates who will probably lose the, the, the Trump yeah. choice, uh, helping the Democrats. And then the Republicans who are outperforming Donald Trump in the states that they're mm. running in, showing that, as, as Chris's argument is, that Trump is actually a weight on the party. Uh, the stakes tonight uh, for the United States Senate are greater than they have ever been in the history 
of control yeah. of the United States mm. Senate. Uh, and, and so this is what we are here to watch. Alex. You can see that in Boldick's campaign. He's the guy that on Tuesday was an election denier, and then the next day was literally like, I mean, kind of just kidding on all that. I mean, he understands the political reality here. Don Boldick has never been a great candidate. He f pledged fealty to Donald Trump, and we see where there, it, that's gotten him. Also, Maggie Hassan was the governor of the state. Let's not discount yeah. that as a prerequisite, a good CV to have. The, uh, I will also say, though, that if if what you guys are describing is going to be how the night ends for Republicans, and the night is young, as I said, you know, the month is young. It's, there's a lot still to come. <laughs> but if it, if it goes like it looks like it's going, and there isn't a gigantic red wave, there's more like a red ripple, you know, and they don't <laughs> they don't win states they, they seats that they should have won yeah. in in circumstances that are overall macro favorable to them, then we're going to be in an interesting situation where Trump looks like he was an albatross around the neck of a lot of these candidates. Mm -hmm. And DeSantis looks like he wired Florida so Republicans can't lose there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the power center in the Republican Party, obviously there's no loss between Trump and DeSantis already. Ari was describing DeSantis as boring Trump earlier, which I think is <laughs> mean, but also it resonates. But if it looks, just in terms of pure power politics, if it looks like Trump picked a lot of fights that he lost and it cost the party a lot of seats and a lot of power, and DeSantis picked fights that fairly or not, he won and it earned the party more power, that's going to put all the more pressure on rational Republican voters to switch horses, to figure out a way to put Trump behind them and, and to switch and over they, to the they same. could have another incentive because uh, what happens tomorrow is that the window opens again on the possible criminal prosecution of Donald Trump. Yeah. The, the political season of us prosecutors will back off for 60 days while there's a campaign going mm -hmm. on. That's over tomorrow. And Donald Trump has picked fights, very directly picked fights, with the federal prosecutors uh, looking into his possession of those documents. He has Fawny Willis in Fulton County in Georgia, who has a, a very strong case against him already. We don't know if he's going to be criminal defendant Trump before the, the, the Republican field for the presidency emerges. Which is why he, plans, sorry, and he might run. I, mean, I was about to say that. that might, that's right. why he's going to run. And then he's going to run to try to keep himself out of prison because he understands sort of the political calculus for the DOJ. Then, then what happens? But speaking of things that we do not know about Georgia, Steve Bernanke <laughs> <laughs> knows things about Georgia. Knows things about Georgia that we do not yet Ooh, know because he's perfect. looking. Segue. We've do got more data in in terms of the Georgia Senate race, and so Steve, we want. I know that you're in the middle of something, but do you mind telling us what you're looking at? Coincidentally <laughs> enough, I was looking at Georgia, so it's it's, it's I, perfect. I know uh, I was peeking. <laughs> it's perfect timing. So yes, what's happened in the last ten minutes or so, I would say, in Georgia is that Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock have kind of uh, 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 switched leads a couple times here because we got two big reports here so let me show you them For, we just got moments ago was a big chunk two-thirds you see here of DeKalb County this may be this is one of the most Democratic counties in the state you can see Joe Biden mm -hmm. won this thing by 68 points back in 2020 so you're getting again this is heavily male early vote here but Warnock obviously winning it overwhelmingly and so that's pushed him back to an advantage statewide what had happened just before that was that we got a big batch of voting from Cherokee County County, which I was talking to you about earlier, uh, typically, traditionally, one of the most Republican vote-producing counties in the country. So Walker is at a point, he's actually running under Trump's number here, but that was enough to give Walker temporarily lead statewide. But to, to, to put this out in the big picture, I think the story that's developing in Georgia is this. You take a look at the, uh, the uh, statewide tally here, and you see Warnock with that lead. There's a lot of vote has come in from Metro Atlanta. I think maybe it's a little disproportionate right now, so I certainly would expect that to tighten, but you also see a clear gap here between Brian Kemp, the Republican governor, who's leading Stacey Abrams by four points, and then in the Senate race, Herschel Walker, who's trailing Raphael Warnock by four points. Mm -hmm. And Cherokee County is a great example of this. Core, huge Republican area. Walker's running at 66. Kemp's running at 72 and a half. Wow. By the way, the Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who found himself in the middle of that uh, 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 whole affair with Donald Trump, is running at 71 percent in Cherokee County here as well, and is also leading statewide. So you're seeing a disconnect between Raffensperger, Kemp, those two Republicans, and Herschel Walker. We also have, if you take a look here, Paulding County, we think just about all the vote, maybe all the vote is in in Paulding County. Again, you're, you're getting a step removed from the immediate Atlanta metro area, core Republican 
looking pretty big area though. Again, Walker running at 60.8% here. There's Kemp running at 65.5% here. And again, you compare that Walker number to the benchmark of Trump in 2020. That's under the Trump number from 2020. So again, we're seeing Walker. There are some rural counties where Walker's putting up some terrific numbers, but you see that he's running behind. He's lagging behind Brian Kemp. You see that Brian Kemp is doing pretty well here in the governor's race so far, and it does set up that possibility. We've talked about a couple of uh, possibilities here. Would Georgia split its vote between Kemp and Warnock? Would Kemp win the race, but Herschel Walker fail and be forced into a runoff, lose out? Th 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 those sorts of possibilities start to come into the mix when you're seeing in places like Cherokee County, Walker just running that far behind uh, Brian Kemp right now. I need to interrupt you just for a moment because we do have a call to make. NBC News has a project projection to make, excuse me, uh, in another Senate race. Uh, this is the, we have it here? Yes, we do. This is the North Dakota Senate race. This is incumbent Republican John Hoven, who was projected to have been reelected in the North Dakota Senate race. His Democratic challenger was Katrina Christensen, but Hoven will be heading back to the United States Senate. Steve, I will take advantage of the fact that I had to interrupt you there to actually ask you about a different Senate race. Can I ask you about North Carolina Senate, where we've got Sherry Beasley, the Democrat, uh, and Republican Congressman Ted Budd? Yeah, let's take a, a closer look here at North Carolina. Zoom out. Out and head up there. So again, the story in Carolina has been that Beasley, and there it is, Bud has now overtaken Beasley in the count with about two thirds of the vote in so far. The, the, the story here mainly has been, as we, if you've been following all night, you know this, the mail vote, the early vote was the first reported out. A lot of these big sort of Democratic areas came out particularly quickly. So Beasley led the tally until really just moments ago. Uh, and it, part of that is we got more vote out of Union County, Union County right outside of Charlotte. Charlotte Mec and Mecklenburg County, core Democratic County. Union County right outside of it is a core Republican county. You you see Ted Budd. In fact, I think now with that update, yeah. So you're seeing he's exceeding the Trump number. You get that early in mail vote reported out in a place like Union County, and it's going to be as good as it gets for the Democrat generally, and maybe the low watermark for the Republican. You start adding in the same day vote, and the numbers tend to get better for the Republicans, worse for the Democrats. And, and this is a crucial benchmark in a place like Union County if you're Ted Budd in this race, because again, Trump won North Carolina very close race, just 75,000 votes in uh, 2020. So if you're Bud, you need to be hitting that Trump number everywhere, and really you need to be exceeding it. And right now, three quarters of the vote, a little bit more in Union. And Bud, earlier in the night, we were showing him under this. Now he's over that Trump number in Union County. So that's helping him statewide. And I'm just going to scan the map here and see Wake County. That's the biggest. This is where Raleigh is. We're still waiting. We've been stuck at 54% there for a while. Johnston County outside of Wake County, sort of big suburban area. Now, again, this is Johnston County here. The Trump number was 61%. If you're Ted Bud with the same day vote still to come in Johnston County, you're Seeing, if you're his campaign, you're seeing an opportunity here with the same day vote to grow that number, to get more votes out of Johnston, you know, to help statewide there. Democrats would look at, yeah, I think that st they still have a lot of vote left in Mecklenburg. They still have a lot of vote left in Wake. Let's take a look over in Guilford County where, yep, where Greensboro is still a lot of vote there. So there are still opportunities here, but again, it's that early same, it's that early vote versus same day vote dynamic here. And, and that's what is the same day dynamic here, I think is pushing Bud a little bit ahead right now. All right, let's go over to Chris Hayes, who is with our team of political insiders. Chris. Hey, Rachel. I'm here with Simone Sanders Townsend, host of Simone, former Missouri Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill, and former RNC Chairman Michael Steele. Simone, let me start with you. You know, I got a text from a friend's mom mm -hmm. uh, from South Carolina saying, what, why doesn't, why is no one covered the North Carolina race? What, we, we had Sherry Beasley on. She had one statewide, had some name recognition. If you looked at the polling in that race, it was consistently a tight race. And there was this sense, I think, of like, eh, it can't really be a tight race. What are you hearing out of North Carolina as Steve just set up what the map looks like for us? So some additional red counties just came in. Before those counties came in, I was hearing that Sherry Beasley was actually outperforming in counties like Alamance, Caswell, Gates. These are very rural places, the sticks, as some people would like to say. Uh, now some more redder counties have come in. They've come in a little faster. Uh, Sherry Beasley's campaign and Democrats on the ground are telling me that some of the Democratic strongholds are still going to take a while to count, like Cumberland, where Sherry Beasley is also from. I have 
long since said that North Carolina is a winnable race. Sherry Beasley won state right, as you said, and running. And she was for a Supreme Court race. And North Carolina judges are elected. I'm also hearing that it looked like Ted Budd is running a little bit behind where the judges' candidates and Republicans are running. And I found that an interesting, you know, dynamic. The chairman and I were talking about yeah. that a little bit yeah. earlier. Let's, splitting. let's talk about where we are right now. So we've, we, we're at the point of the night where we have some data, very, very partial picture, but some data, and we can sort of incorporate that into the expectations. You were at the RNC during that, the, the, the 2010 right. midterms, right? So that's a historic drubbing. It's 63-seat gain by Republicans no. in the House, seven Senate seats, right? Oh, uh, like yeah, some, somewhere, some somewhere that ballpark, there. Right? Six, I think. Six, six. six Senate, 800 legislative. So that, that was, that's like the tail end, right? That's like right. the total and complete whooping. And tonight, as we went in tonight, I was expected for everything from that, like blood on the wall, right? Like total, <laughs> total massacre, slaughter, yeah. slaughter to Democrats doing surprisingly well. Where, where are we in that spectrum from where you sit, from what we have so far, which is early in preliminary? There's splatters of blood on the wall, <laughs> largely from Florida. Yeah. Um, yes. But as, as, a, as you look around the country, you see uh, there's not a whole lot of hemorrhaging by Democrats here. Uh, they have their base vote, their, particularly their younger voters, have shown up. I've gotten a lot of uh, background information on how the young vote has turned out uh, and, and it's made a difference in a number of races. So that, that sense that there was going to be a huge wave. Now, again, we still have the West uh, that's totally. got to come in. So we're, and regional you know, variation regional and, variations and all that. But the dynamics tell me that this this is more of a skirmish that you know will have some blood on the floor, maybe right. a little bit on the wall. But the Dems are going to walk on the other side. I think the Senate is still going to be in play. I, I still see that landing more in their column than not. So you're looking at the House again. I. Claire and I had this discussion the, last night. She's in the sort of 25 to 35 range. I'm in the 18 to 25 range on the House. We'll see how, but it's not, this is nowhere near 2010 like a lot of folks were talking. Yeah, that, that to me, all you, you can't say anything other than where are we in that tail distribution. Right. And I think when you look at that Jennifer Wexton hung cow race, right, which is like a Biden plus 18 seat, in these real wave elections, right, there's always that seat. <laughs> Or that race where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that person lost. And we haven't, aside from Miami Dade going Republican. Which is special. Right. Which is it's special. special. <laughs> have you seen special. anything like that that's brought you up short yet? No. And the one thing we don't probably talk enough about, because we get fixated on control of Congress, governors matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've had horrible cycles winning governor's yes. seats. We're going to flip. Four or five governor seats from Republican to Democrat tonight. Um, and key, we're going to hold on to a place like Michigan. We're going to win in Pennsylvania. Well, we'll, see. we'll see. I'm just telling you, <laughs> I, I believe we will hold on in Michigan, and I think we're going to win Pennsylvania. You know, we competed in Oklahoma. I think the Democratic governor in Kansas is going to hold on. And you know what I noticed in the exit polls? You know how many hundreds of millions of dollars has been spent on crime in terms of advertising this cycle? It was not top And three. it was 11 percent thought it was the most important. I, Can I say something Way about lower than abortion. Along these points. Way lower than abortion. That jumped so out at me as well. Yeah. It is like, it's not going to work just to pretend well, that we have the worst crime in the world uh, with video feedings selectively into people's households. If the economy continues to get better, because that was what really outweighed abortion. What are the Republicans going to do about these extreme laws and the effort that's going to happen in Congress to make abortion illegal all over the country? I think you need to bold and underline what the senator just said here. Young people are turning out all over this country in places like Wisconsin. There, um, the college campuses were both early vote locations and now polling places. People are still in line. The polls just closed in Wisconsin at 9 p.m. Eastern time, 8 p.m. Central. And they were telling people to stay in line because they were concerned that the students would get out thinking they couldn't vote. This issue of abortion, a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, is an animating issue. And I think that young people were just tuned in. So for all the people that said all these things about young people across America, they didn't care, they weren't going to vote, young people are showing up in key places. And I think it's going to be a story we talk about Can going I just forward. I have a, a point of personal privilege yeah. real quick. I want to give a shout out to Westmore, first elected African-American, only the third for governor in the yeah. United States history. 20 years ago tonight, 
I won for lieutenant governor, breaking that barrier That's as correct. first African American elected statewide. And he's a rock star. And one, one of two so. of state uh, governorships, including yeah. Massachusetts, that have flipped, according to our call so far. Simone Sanders Townsend, Claire McCaskill, and Michael Steele, thank you all for your insights. Rachel, back to you. I just want to make clear that despite Mr. Steele's comments there, NBC News has not made a projection in the Maryland governor's oh, race. That race is currently characterized I'm, as I'm sorry. too I'm just, early I'm to call. I'm just looking at what the, the local papers are reporting. <laughs> so. I hear you, but I, it's my responsibility to keep us tethered no, to the you election. Did, you did it right, too, Rachel. Too early to call with Westmore leading is our official projection. But I do have two official calls that I can tell you on two other governor's races. NBC News can now project at this hour in the governor's race in the great state of Colorado, the Democratic incumbent governor there, Jared Polis, has been reelected. Uh, his Republican challenger was not able to go the distance in the Arkansas governor's race. Sarah Huckabee Sanders will be the next governor of the state of Arkansas following in the footsteps of her father, Mike Huckabee. We're going to take a quick break right now. We've got much more when we come back. We've got all those marquee Senate races that we are still watching. And as our political insiders were just alluding to, in terms of what's happening in their house, the Republicans knew they would have a good night tonight. It looks like it may not be quite the huge night that they were expecting. We'll try Try to put some data on that impression when we get back. Stay with us. Michael Steele, avatar of the future. We've got a Maryland Senate race to call, and NBC News projects that the winner in the Maryland Senate race is incumbent Democrat Chris Van Hollen, de defeating his Republican challenger, Chris Chafee. And at this hour in the Senate, that means we are looking at 39 Senate seats under Democratic Party control and 40 Senate seats under Republican Party control, 21 seats yet to be decided. And in the aforementioned Maryland <laughs> governor's race, here it is, uh, NBC News projects wow. that the winner of the Maryland governor's race is mm. Wes Moore. So Democrats picking up that governor's seat in Maryland and holding on to that Senate seat in Maryland. Um, in terms of what's going on in the House, everybody talks about the size of the, um, the wave, right? The size of the uh, snapback against the president's party in a midterm election. It is a political science rule, which is almost never violated, that the president's party loses seats in the first midterm election after a president has gained the White House. For example, there have been two times in the last century when that rule has not held. Once was in 2002, right after 9-11, and one was in 1934. The president's party, whatever party holds the White House, the first midterm after that president is elected, they always lose seats. Now, the Republicans only need to pick up five seats in order to win the majority in the House of Representatives this year. Historically, just looking at the numbers, they are likely to do that. Now, what looks like a normal midterm pickup number for the party that's out of power? Well, in the last midterm in 2018, the Republican Party lost 40 seats. In the Republican before that, in the midterm before that, in 2014, the Democrats were in power in the White House. They lost 13 seats. In 2010, the midterm before that, Democrats lost 63 seats. Mm. In 2006, the Republicans had the White House, they lost 30 seats. So again, 40 seats, 13 seats, 63 seats, 30 seats. That's what we've seen in previous midterms. The Republicans only need five seats tonight in order to take control of the House. But how are they doing? Heading into tonight's midterm elections, you heard very bombastic predictions from a lot of Republican pundits and even polling firms saying that Republicans were going to have like a, you know, a 2010 style 63 seat win. We don't know what it's going to look like at the end of the night, but Steve Kornacki has been tracking how big the swing might be in the House if it in fact swings at all. Steve? Yeah, so uh, the, here's a way of taking a look at the House here. We're looking at the 7th District of Michigan right now. Um, not actually focusing on the 7th District. It happens to be on the screen as you come to me. But what I want you to focus your attention on is the right side of the screen. Because what we've done is we've organized the competitive or potentially competitive House races into a series of categories here. And again, keeping in mind the idea here, as you say, Republicans need a net gain of five seats just to get control of the House. Now, we talked 
talked in the early hours tonight about how the Florida map had been aggressively redrawn to give Republicans some additional seats, and they succeeded. Florida 4, Florida 13, and Florida 7. These all count as flips. These all count as Republican gains. These are all the result of a, of a redrawn map in Florida. And if you look at this list, these are all districts currently held by Democrats that were won by Trump. So this is sort of the, the first line of attack for Republicans. Uh, Trump already won them. Can their candidates win? There's a couple others here, as I say. Tennessee, five, redrawn aggressively, uh, you know, to the Republicans' benefit, and Georgia, six. So there's sort of five on this list here that were redrawn in, in, in that kind of a way to really benefit Republicans. So that, if they can win all five of those, is a gain of five. Let's look beyond those districts, though, because we're also starting to get some results from elsewhere as well. For instance, the ninth district of Ohio, we're ticking up toward half the vote in. You're starting to get same day vote in. Again, this is Marcy Kaptur, longtime Democratic incumbent, redrawn into this uh, Trump district, gets this very controversial Republican opponent who's had scandal kind of rock his campaign. And, you know, Kaptur has a real chance to hold on here. Take a look at Pennsylvania's 8th district. Now, I know we're dealing with a lot of mail in ballots so far, so these numbers are going to change, but this is Matt Cartwright. This is a district Trump won in 2020. Cartwright survived. Scranton, this is Joe Biden's native. Uh, area here, Pennsylvania 8. So Democrats trying to hold on in, in a place like this. The 3rd District of Iowa, we got about a third of the vote in. This is Democratic friendly vote that's in, but Cindy Oxney trying to hold on there for the Democrats. What I'm trying to say here is outside of the obviously drawn pickup opportunities for Republicans, which we've seen them cash in on three and we see them in position to do the same potentially in two more, you're not seeing right now automatically, you're not seeing clear Republican paths to pick up in these other seats that I'm showing you. This is the first line of attack, as I say, for Republicans to try to get that majority. Now, let's take a look here. I went too far. Take a look here at the next line. So this is... Get me to that second one. Thank you very much. These are... Now, now we're talking about vulnerable Democratic seats, but none of these are in districts that were carried by Donald Trump. So these are districts that are a little bit more uh, competitive politically. They're all democratically held. Republicans are hoping these are the kinds of seats in a wave that would go. Seats like North Carolina won. We got about 85% of the vote in right now. The Democrats are leading in North Carolina won. New Hampshire won. We don't have much vote in, but everything I've been showing you about that Senate race in New Hampshire, where Maggie Hassan is, is hitting all the benchmarks you know, that she would need to hit so far at least, Pappas, the Democrat hitting those same benchmarks in his part of the state as well. Mm. That's an encouraging early sign for Democrats. Indiana's first district, we set this one up at the start of the night here. Frank Mervan, Democratic incumbent, take a look here. You see him leading, but what's most interesting about it is the area of the district that has the least amount of vote counted is Lake County. It's where Gary is. It's the biggest part and it's the most Democratic part of the district. So that's an encouraging sign for Democrats as well. Um, it, it, you could take a look here. Uh, Illinois 6, the votes are starting to come in. Again, Democratic-friendly votes so far. But uh, the, again, the point that I'm making here is this next line, these are districts you know, that, that, that Biden carried to some degree here, but all of these districts would look like ripe targets for Republicans, and you're not immediately looking at results in any of these and saying, there's the Republican pickup we're about to call. There's the Republican pickup we're about to call. <clears throat> and it's true as it extends, uh, <laughs> this thing is not cooperating as much, as it extends into this. Now, this is the same set of districts here we're talking about. Again, we're talking about vulnerable Democratic-held seats here. So take a look like at Virginia. Virginia 7. We told you the story a minute ago. We're still waiting on the absentee vote from two heavily Democratic areas of this district. An opportunity still for Spanberger, who's trailing by 5,400 votes, to catch Yesley Vega and to save this seat for Democrats. You take a look at Pennsylvania 7, Susan Wilde. Again, it's early, it's heavily male. That's one they need to hold on to. Here's one that Democrats are very excited about right now, Rhode Island, too. Now, this was a heavily Biden district, but Alan Fung, the Republican candidate here, got a lot of national attention. Uh, this thing was seen as a pure toss-up yeah, race heading into today. And we're getting up to 90 percent of the vote. And actually, what we've seen happening here is mail vote coming in, vote by mail coming in, and pushing Seth Magaziner into the lead in this district. So again, now we're just, as you say, oh, in Ohio 13, again, we're basically dealing with this is the district 
district that Tim Ryan left to run for the United States Senate. So it's wow. in his neck of the woods. Now, again, we're dealing with early male vote here. This is going to be the high water mark for Democrats. But this could, is this high enough for Democrats to withstand the same day and win? It's certainly possible right now. You're not looking at this district and saying, oh, yeah, I could see Republicans are definitely on their way to winning there. Henry Cuellar in Texas's 28th district, probably the most conservative Democrat in the House, survived a primary challenge from the left, running in this region of deep south Texas that we saw go he trend heavily towards the Republicans in 2020. Now, it's some, some of Cuellar's best areas of the district are reporting so far, but with half the vote, he's sitting near 60 percent right there. Again, I'm just what I'm showing you is outside of those sort of gimme seats in Florida and plus one in Tennessee and one in Georgia, I I'm not showing you seats where at this moment Republicans are clearly poised to get flips. That's not to say they're not going to get some flips in those uh, in those seats that I just showed you. Um, meanwhile, and they did pick up a, a two new seats, but what I wanted to show you was Democrats themselves have some tar have some seats that they here we go. Democrats themselves have some seats that they could flip. That's this page right here. So take a look like at Michigan 3. This is where in the Republican primary, Peter Meyer, the Republican incumbent, was beaten by John Gibbs. Meyer, the pro-impeachment Republican, running in a district. This is Grand Rapids area, running in a district that Biden won by eight points. That is just 6% of the vote right here. This is Republican-friendly vote that we're looking at right now. This is a clear pickup opportunity for Democrats. Ohio won. Steve, yep. before you do Ohio won, but stick a pin in that, I'll come yep. right back to you. We have a quick call that we need to make. It's in an important Senate race. The Colorado Senate race, NBC News can now project that incumbent Democratic Senator Michael Bennett has been reelected in the Colorado Senate race. This was a highly uh, tightly watched race because the Republicans were very confident in their candidate there, Joe O'Day. But Joe O'Day comes up short. And Michael Bennett will be returning to the Senate. Back to you, Steve. Yeah. So and that, that by the way, that Colorado call, it has implications for the Senate. As you say, there's also a competitive House race in Colorado, too. And if Michael Bennett's doing well, that might portend well for the Democrats in that House race. But we're looking at here, again, we've established that Republicans need a net gain of five. We saw them draw themselves about, about a half a dozen pickups uh, it, we've already gone through. So what Democrats need to do, the two screens I showed you before this, they need to protect the vast majority of those seats that I just took you through, and then they need to play offense. And this is where the Democrats need to play offense if they're going to have a chance yeah, we're talking about this for real right now. If they're going to have a chance at holding the House. Wow. So we just showed you that Michigan 3 on this list looms as a very clear opportunity for them. So right now, what you're seeing on your screen is the 1st District of Ohio. This is down in the Cincinnati area. Again, redistricting, uh, Steve Shabbat, of all the Republicans in Ohio, got the worst deal from redistricting. He's, it's a heavily Cincinnati-based district right here. About half the vote is in. He's trailing right now. Let's see what happens in that remaining half. If the Democrats can hang on, that would be a pickup for them. Take a look as well at North Carolina 13, now with 70% of the vote in here. And again, it's same day to come. It's getting close. Bo Hines, the Republican, though, is running eight points behind the Democrat. Well, and Nicholas, numbers been coming down. Hines has been coming up. This is an opportunity for Democrats. This is one that they will badly need. Uh, again, if they're going to, Illinois 13 is another one. This was, redistricting in Illinois was done by Democrats in an aggressive way to maximize their number of seats. So Illinois 13, previously a Republican seat held by Rodney Davis, redrawn Democrats. Biden carried up by 11 points under the new lines. It's early, but it's a clear pickup opportunity for Democrats tonight. So. The big picture on the House, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of this right now, the big picture on the House is we came into the night knowing that Republicans had drawn themselves a handful of pretty obvious pickups, and there's no reason to think they're not going to get those pickups, but so far at 9.39 p.m., I'm not seeing in any of those vulnerable Democrats, outside of the second district of Virginia, that's where Elaine Lurie, the Democrats, continuing to run behind. It's tough to find many where you look at it right now and you say, well, there, that Democrat's going down, that Democrat's going down. They seem to be in the game in these vulnerable seats where we're getting vote right now. They seem to be also very much in the game in a number of these seats 
where they would be getting gains of their own. And that, again, if they're going to have any chance of holding the House, that's ultimately what they're going to need to do. They're going to need to weather those losses they've already taken, and they're likely to take in a few other places, and they're going to need to counterpunch with some gains. And as I just showed you, there are some opportunities. There are some clear opportunities for that. I want to get Incredible. your guys' response to this. I do have a quick call before we do that. Uh, right now, NBC News at this hour is able to project that in the Oklahoma governor's race, the Republican incumbent, Kevin Stitt, uh, will be reelected. This was not a foregone conclusion, even though uh, Oklahoma is such a reliably red state. Uh, Joy Hoffmeister ran a great campaign against Kevin Stitt, and he ran into a lot of bumps in the road. But NBC News now projects that he will be returned as the incumbent governor of Oklahoma. Uh, back to what Steve was saying, I mean, again, it's early days, and woe be upon any of us who project to the end of the night or the end of the month based on what we've seen already. But it does seem like Republicans are probably not having the fireworks they expected to be having already by this time of the night, right? Yeah. The, the word wave has no application yet to what we're seeing. It might uh, still, it, but it, it doesn't now. It might not uh, ever. This might feel more like the edge of a lake, you know, with the just <laughs> moving up an, an inch or two here and there. Uh, New York 22 uh, was on Steve's board of Republican seats that could go Democrat. That was identified for me today by New York political operatives as saying, watch that one. It looks like the Democrats. They believed in the early afternoon it looks like the Democrats might actually pick that one up. And they were looking at it just to see if there would be a red wave. They just wanted to see, is the Demo Democrat going to lose by a lot? By the middle of the afternoon, they were starting to think, wait, the Democrat might actually win. And so that is the math that Steve's talking about, where even though you see uh, a few House seats going uh, from uh, the Democrats to the Republicans in Florida already, uh, it's, the, it's the ones that the Democrats might take away from the Republicans that will decide this. And I'll also, I was having conversations with people on the ground in Ohio earlier today, and the two races that they mentioned were Amelia Sykes and Greg Landsman, the Shabbat seat uh, that you just saw Steve talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were assuring me that these are seats that are definitely vulnerable. A Republican incumbent in trouble there. The, yeah. Two Republican incumbents there. And so Democrats are really confident. They're getting a lot of vote out of Hamilton County. Normally when I think Ohio and I think about the vote there and how Democrats can do well, I just go Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga. <laughs> Suddenly <laughs> Hamilton County, they're seeing actually even like smaller races like they're picking up like local races you know not even races that would be on our radar mm. they're looking really strong in picking up judicial races and stuff that's really local they're working really hard in that county so if Tim Ryan has a shot in Ohio it's gonna interestingly enough be because he overperforms including in very very black I mean, inclusively black areas of Hamilton mm -hmm. and his issue right now seemed earlier today to be Cuyahoga County and I'll just say one more thing that you know we talked earlier about you know Florida is sui generis, and I think people have a tendency because it's it gets called early, so people think, well, it means something for the national political scene. It means nothing. It is it is a planet of its own. Yeah. It is special. But <laughs> one of the things that is interesting to me about what the now reelected governor of Florida did is he put a lot of weight in countering Trump. Part of their little war was who they endorsed. He endorsed O'Day. So it, so the idea that against the same, Michael Bennett, in against Colorado. Michael Bennett, yeah. mm -hmm. and Trump attacked him and went crazy and went mm -hmm. crazy about O'Day. If DeSantis can pick up a pretty easy win in Florida, but he doesn't have like endorsement power like Trump, That's a very it's going to be hard yeah. for Republicans to say we can replace Trump with DeSantis because DeSantis can do a lot of stuff in Florida, ripping the masks off and getting reelected and redistricting the state so that yeah. Republicans right. can win without him. trying. Mm -hmm. But yes. can he project that kind of political power that Trump? Projects? They're still addicted to the Trump There's Trump more to drugs. say about all of this, and I want to hear it, but I do need to interrupt with a change in characterization. This is not the call of a race, but this is a change. In the North Carolina Senate race, this is previously characterized by NBC News as too early to call between Democrat Sherry Beasley and Republican Ted Budd. It's no longer too early to call. It's now too close to call, which mm. itself is mm. interesting. Congressman Ted Budd is a Trump endorsee. He was one of the objectors on January 6th. He's very far down the number line on that side. Sherry Beasley, uh, the Democrat in this race, is the former Chief Justice of the North Carolina State Supreme Court um, and a very impressive candidate in her own right. Uh, but this is, is now considered to be too close to call rather than too early to call uh, in North Carolina. Yet another sign that this, this night, uh, while it is a lot of things, it is not a uh, slam dunk um, for anyone on either side of the aisle. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back.
Nevada polls close in about 10 minutes. Our friend Jacob Soboroff is live for us right now in Henderson, Nevada, with only about 10 minutes on the clock. Jacob, it looks like there's still a ton of people there. Yeah, maybe as many, Rachel, as three, four hundred. I was just talking to the uh, election officials way at the front of the line. When I talked to you guys last about three hours ago, there was only one line uh, right here, and it ended all the way up by the Christmas tree. Now, now it kind of doubles back uh, three times, almost like an amusement park. And let me just show you what's going on here. The line actually still snakes uh, almost, I think, hold on one second, let me just run and check, I think all the way outside. Yeah, so there, are, so there are people outside uh, right now, Rachel, that are waiting in this line. And I think, you know, what's important to note for people who are watching us right now, for people who might still be in this line, if you are in this line, uh, within the next 10 minutes, you are going to get to vote. Even if you're outside, this mall actually closes uh, at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock local time. Uh, but they want everybody to vote. So when I talked to you last, I think the total was just over 2,000. The tally as of right now uh, is of almost 2,500 people uh, have voted at this location. Uh, and I have, I've been monitoring what John Ralston, the dean of the Nevada Press Corps, has been saying about turnout here, that uh, overall, it appears to him to be lower uh, than he expected it to be. That hasn't been the case here. It also has not been the case at the Boulevard Mall, another mall not too far away from here, where my understanding is right now the lines uh, are about an hour long. I've just been watching these guys. You, you guys, you're at the very back of the line. You think you're going to wait it out? You got the chips that they've been passing out. They've been passing out Cheetos, Rachel, to people in line. You going to wait? Right on. Yeah, we're definitely going to wait. Um, we care about things that we care about, women's rights, you know, everybody's rights. So, yeah. And that's what's motivating you. All right, right. As Rachel said, right on. Nice to meet you guys. Very, thank you very much for talking to me. That's all right. I'll give you a dab. Uh, all right, Rachel, this is, uh, this is the machinery of democracy is working. The gears are turning. Uh, and hundreds of people to go here uh, at, this, uh, at this mall in Anderson. Nevada. Jacob, does everybody is everybody getting Cheetos or do people have a choice of snacks or are these <laughs> self catering or is there a Cheetos distribution network? I, Asking for a friend. I, I did just go grab a slice of Sbarro, to be honest, in between uh, talking to you last time and this time. Uh, they're not passing out Sbarro, but they are passing out uh, uh, lots of different snacks. And I, and I have to say, shout out to the election protection workers who are actually the ones uh, that are doing that. There's election monitors, yeah. Republican and Democrat here. They're making sure that they think things go smoothly. Uh, and one of the things that they do is make sure that people are, are well nourished, or maybe not so well nourished, but nourished while they're in line. <laughs> At least have something to crunch. Jacob, thank you very, very much. Again, uh, right. Jacob Soboroff is in Henry. Anderson, Nevada, and Nevada is a place where the polls are closing uh, in about eight minutes. We've got poll closings coming up at 10 o'clock Eastern in Nevada and in Utah, where there's an interesting Senate race. Republican incumbent Mike Lee facing an independent challenger uh, in Evan McMullen. Uh, we've also got the Montana polls closing at 10 o'clock. Montana is one of the places that's got a variety of a, a type of abortion ban that's on the ballot. So we've got lots of interesting poll closings coming up just within the next few minutes. Um, Steve, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question about... Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, forgive me, I'm interrupting myself. There is <laughs> a projection to make. NBC News projects at this hour that the Republican incumbent governor of South Dakota, Kristi Noem, has been re-elected in that state. Forgive me. Kristi Noem will be returned to the governor's mansion in South Dakota. Um, Steve, I wanted to ask you about a race characterization change that we just had. North Carolina Senate just moved from too early to call between Sherry Beasley and Ted Budd to now being too close to call. Can you give us any insight into why there was that change? Yeah, let's let's take a look now at the lay of the lane in North Carolina because you see Ted Budd is leading in the statewide tally right now, a margin of about 113, 112,000 votes right there. Um, there are some areas here, and I think we showed this one earlier, a place like Union County, this is a big, you know, right outside of Charlotte, core Republican area, where Ted Budd is running a couple points better than Donald Trump. So there's some good news for Republicans on this map, but Sherry Beasley's countering that in, in, in some important places, and she also has a, a sort of a potential weapon here in where the vote is still to come in. So let me show you what I mean by that. Take a look here. This is where Asheville is, okay, Western North Carolina here. Now, this is a core Democratic county, but take a look. We basically got all the vote in from here. Beasley 61, Bud 36. Compare it to the 2020 presidential result. And this is a this big size county here in Western North Carolina, and Beasley is improved by point and a half, basically, a little bit better than that over Joe Biden's showing. Joe Biden lost this.
this state to Donald Trump by 1.3 points. So if you're see the, the benchmark for Beasley, every county we go to is to hit the Biden number and exceed it by a point. If she's exceed, give or take, but it, generally if she's exceeding it by a point in a county, she's getting the job done. So you see a place like Asheville, Western North Carolina, she, right now, she's, that, that's what she wants to see out of there. Take a look, I'm trying to get this to move south here. Take a look to Henderson County. Republican county here, right? Beasley's number is actually a little bit underneath Biden's, but Bud's number is underneath Trump is underneath Trump's number too. So Bud's not getting quite what he was expecting out of here. Now take a look like here's a core Democratic county, Orange County. This is where Chapel Hill is. You know, Democrats are going to get a big number, but Beasley is getting two points better than Joe Biden got uh, out of Orange County. Take a look down in Chatham County. This is where Pittsburgh is, uh, basically all in. Sherry Beasley is getting about two and a half points better, 2.3 points better than Joe Biden got. She's running better than the Biden number in a number of places across the state right now. And what's still to come is a ton of vote in Wake County. This is where Raleigh is. A ton of vote in Mecklenburg County. This is where Charlotte is. I feel like we've been stuck somewhere in the 50s since we started giving you the Mecklenburg uh, a tally. And again, can Beasley stay ahead of that Biden number in Mecklenburg? She's significantly ahead of the Biden number in Wake. Could she run a few points ahead of it in Wake? There are opportunities here if, if for Sherry Beasley if she could land in a place like Wake County two, three points above Biden, couple that with really high turnout, there's an opportunity here for her potentially to catch Bud, just checking back in on that statewide, to catch Bud in that statewide tally. So it's not, it's not impossible, and I think as it's come more into focus and you see that much remaining vote in those core Democratic areas, it moves into that too close to call category. Take a look here, by the way, at Georgia, just to update you on what's going on here, because we got three quarters of the vote in Georgia. Look at this in the Senate wow. race. 1,400 votes separating Walker and Warnock, and that scenario we're talking about really does start to come into focus right here. The libertarian candidate, Chase Oliver, is sitting there basically at 2%. Both Walker and Warnock are under 50% right now. And compare that to the governor's race, where in the governor's race, Brian Kemp has opened up a pretty comfortable advantage over Stacey Abrams. And this story we've been telling is just, it, it, it's become clear. We got all the vote in in Cherokee County. All right, Brian Kemp has won it by basically 50 points. Brian Kemp, again, we said that Trump wasn't getting out of Cherokee what Republicans used to get. Kemp starts to bring them back to that level. What's Walker doing in the Senate race? Hey, he's not doing what Kemp's doing. He's running under the Trump level. And we're seeing that in some of these counties in that next tier right outside of the Atlanta metro area. So you look at Georgia, if you're a Republican, you're feeling good about Brian Kemp. But the Walker situation here is he's underperforming Kemp significantly and potentially in a very costly way. And bottom line, with that third-party candidate looking close to 2% there with the statewide number, that could potentially be, again, runoff territory if neither candidate gets, net, does not get to 50%. I do have a couple, I do have at least one call to make. Uh, in the Louisiana U.S. Senate race, NBC News can now project that incumbent Republican Senator John Kennedy has been reelected. His de Democratic opponent was Gary Chambers. But John Kennedy will be returning to the United States Senate. At this hour, the Democrats control 40 seats in the Senate. The Republicans control 41. There's still 19 seats to go. We do have two minor changes in characterization, both in the same direction. In the New York governor's race, this race is still considered too early to call. But I can tell you that NBC now describes this as one, a race in which Kathy Hochul is in the lead. Again, too early to call, but incumbent Democrat Kathy Hochul in the lead. Similarly, in the main governor's race, the Democratic incumbent there is Janet Mills. It is too early to call between her and her Republican challenger, the former governor of Maine, Paul LePage. It is too early to call, but NBC News's election desk now characterizes Democratic incumbent Janet Mills as being in the lead. So again, in the New York governor's race and in the main governor's race, we've got Democratic incumbents there, uh, both in the lead, although they're both too early to call. It's fascinating. I mean, the thing that I think is the clearest is, you know, just to, I'm going to do what Lawrence was doing and I'm just going to repeat Chris, Chris Hayes' <laughs> lines, is that Don, there is a tax on Republicans who are who were picked by Trump. His can't, they can say whatever they want about Trump. They seem to be very beholden to him, but he really ain't good at picking candidates. Well, at picking well, winners. Here's, the, here's the other thing. I mean, the whole frame and the media felt 
into this trap as well, was that Democrats can't win with inflation where it is. That's that was right. wrong. Yeah. Voters seem to have made complicated, in some instances, picking a Republican and Democrat. Inflation wasn't the political cudgel that Republicans made it out to be. Correct. It's painful in people's lives. Economic anxiety is real. But Republicans ran on weaponizing it against Democrats. And I think voters aren't stupid. They didn't run on solving it. Right. They were for Liz Truss's policies, right. which ended her prime minister. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what they were on TV touting. Three more weeks and the cavalry is coming, said Stephen Moore. So I think the fact that they ran on crime and they ran on inflation and they didn't have any solutions, voters saw through some of that. Yep. 10 o'clock in about 15 seconds uh, <laughs> here on the East Coast. The poll closings at 10 o'clock are Montana and Nevada and Utah. Again, we're still watching all of the close Senate races in the country right now, but with polls closing right now in those three states, uh, this is what we can tell you in terms of the NBC News election desk and projections at this hour. In the Nevada Senate race, we've got a Democratic incumbent, Catherine Cortez Masto, facing a Republican challenge from Adam Laxalt. This race is currently not characterized on our screen, but I believe this is too early to call. Correct? Yes. In the Utah Senate race, incumbent Republican Mike Lee facing an independent challenge from Evan McMullen. This is also too early to call. Hmm. In the Nevada governor's race, we're looking at a Democratic incumbent, Steve Sisolak, who's facing a Republican challenge from Joe Lombardo. This is all too, also too early to call. Again, so too early in Nevada Senate, Utah Senate, and Nevada governors. Let's recap what's going on in some of these closely watched Senate races. The North Carolina Senate race, it is too close to call between Republican Ted Budd and Democrat Sherry Beasley. In the Georgia Senate race, it is too early to call between Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock and Republican Herschel Walker. Look how tight they are. In the Ohio Senate race, it is too early to call between Republican J.D. Vance and Democrat Tim Ryan. That's with about two-thirds of the vote in. In the Pennsylvania Senate race, with about 40 percent of the vote in, it is too early to call between Democrat John Fetterman and Republican Mehmet Oz. In the New Hampshire, interesting Senate race here, it is too early to call Maggie Hassan, the Democratic incumbent facing Republican Don Balduck. We've got a little bit less than 40% of the vote in. It is too early to call in New Hampshire. And in Arizona, we are looking at a too early to call race between Mark Kelly, the Democratic incumbent, and the Republican challenger, Blake Masters. At this hour, the Democrats control 40 Senate seats. The Republicans control 41. 19 are still in play. Steve, you, we, we've been talking a lot about the overall battle for the House and these individual House races that you're watching. You got more new news for us on that front? Yeah. Why don't we start in Ohio? Because we talked about Ohio is important. Uh, a couple different districts here for different reasons. So you can see the Senate race here right now with Vance about two-thirds in ahead of Ryan. I was just looking at some of the counties where we have all of the vote in and what the pattern that I'm finding so far is that Vance seems to be running underneath Donald Trump's number but not underneath it necessarily to the degree he would need to for Ryan to win outright there are still some big Democratic areas with a lot of vote but there are some encouraging counties for Vance remember Trump won this state by eight points but when you take a look at the house races the key house races in Ohio let's start up here in Marcy Captors district and again this is one of those Trump voting Democratic held districts. It's in that first line of attack for Republicans, right? This district was drawn in a way where uh, Republicans looked at it and said, we're going to pick this up. Marcy Kapter, 40 year Democrat veteran, two thirds of the vote in here. Now let's dive a little deeper and show you these are the co component counties of the district. And you see Kapter's leading. And we know that what's being counted right now is primarily same day vote, which is generally the most Republican friendly vote. So you'd say, okay, chance for Majewski here. Here's the problem. Problem for Majewski. Let me take in a quick tour of the district here. Look how much vote is in in the core Republican counties. They're already up to 90% in Defiance County, basically 90% in Williams, over 93% in Fulton. You look over here in Sandusky County, they're over 90%. Ottawa County, which is very competitive, you know, they're basically now look where there's still outstanding vote. The mother load, Lucas County, okay, which is where Toledo is. Now it's same day vote. But it's going to be Democratic vote, probably. This is not going to be at the same margin that we've been seeing captor in the early in the mail. The, the most outstanding vote in this district is coming from a core Democratic area, and captor already leads in the district. So if you're a Democrat, I think you're very excited by what you're seeing in that race right there. Now let's go down south to, to the Cincinnati-based 
first congressional district. And this one's getting close, and this one's going to be very, very important to that math we were running through earlier. This is Steve Shabbat, a Republican incumbent. Whose, whose district was redrawn into being a Biden plus eight district. He's being challenged by a member of the Cincinnati City Council, Greg Landsman. So ba the district is Hamilton County, Cincinnati, plus this is Warren County, Republican territory. Now you take a look, Shabbat's running up the score here in Warren County. There are still votes to come, same day votes. You expect that to be heavily Republican. So Shabbat with an opportunity to make gains there, but take a look in the Cincinnati portion of the district, which is bigger. It's two thirds of the vote already for Landsman. Now again, the same day should be more friendly to Shabbat, but there's an opportunity here for Landsman to still win and make gains with the same day vote in Hamilton County. This is a very winnable race for Democrats, and if they win it, that's a pickup. They get a pickup out of that district. We're also looking at, excuse me, the 13th district here. Again, now we're starting to get the same day. If you remember, we checked in here about 20 minutes ago, and the Democrat Amelia Sykes was ahead probably by about uh, you know, 25, 30 points, something like that. That was on the strength of the mail and the early vote. Now you're counting up the same day. Now it's starting to get close, but this is one again. This is Tim Ryan's district. He's vacated it to run for the Senate. Democrats would like to hold on to this one. Again, if we just show you the big picture here, right? First line of attack for Republicans in terms of getting control of the House. They did get, we were showing you Georgia 6. It's one of those districts that was redrawn to practically guarantee a Republican win. They're getting the win there. So they've picked up four here. And again, Tennessee 5 is one we've been showing you. It was all also redrawn for the same purposes. But when you start to move away from those, you're talking about, for instance, Ohio 9, which I just took you through. And if you look at the next line here, you don't see, we're, we're, what, what time are we now? 10.06 p.m., vulnerable Democratic held seats. You haven't had a single one called for the Republicans yet. They haven't been called for the Democrats either, but the Democrats are in the game in all these. You know, six point lead for the Democrats in North Carolina's first congressional district. Let's check in on the sixth district of Illinois. Now, more than half the vote is in. Sean Caston leading by uh, 11 points over his Republican opponent. Let's look at uh, Lauren Underwood, about half the vote. She's leading by 16 points. Connecticut 5, I don't know that we have much. Yeah, this is sort of Waterbury, Litchfield County. Johanna Hayes, Democrats, uh, Republicans, uh, excuse me, Republicans are very excited about this district. We'll see. It's very early there. But again, it's that storyline is continuing here uh, on the House side where you just work hours in right now, and the only gains Republicans have put on the board so far, really are in the seats that were drawn to give them gains. Steve, thank you. We have a few updates for our viewers in terms of characterizations of various races. In the Nebraska governor's race, NBC News can now project that the Republican in that race, Jim Pillen, is the projected winner in the Nebraska governor's race. Over to Wyoming, NBC News can now project that the winner of the Wyoming governor's race is the Republican incumbent, Mark Gordon. He has been reelected. We have a change in characterization in the Pennsylvania governor's race. This race is still overall considered to be too early to call, but NBC News says that Josh Shapiro is leading in the Pennsylvania governor's race. We have another similar change in the New Hampshire Senate race, which at base level is still considered to be too early to call. But NBC News now says that incumbent Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan is leading in the New Hampshire Senate race. We also want to look in on one race that is a statewide race of national interest for a lot of reasons, the New York Attorney General's race. Democrat Letitia James is projected to be re-elected as New York's Attorney General. She is the projected winner in New York. Obviously, Letitia James has a very high-profile role as New York's Attorney General, in large part because of her office's work um, to investigate and bring a civil case and be involved in a criminal case involving the business of former President Donald Trump. Um, Steve, I would like to go back to you on the Wisconsin Senate race, if you've got anything. This is incumbent Republican Ron Johnson versus the Democrat Mandela Barnes. Yeah, and, and so what you're seeing here is about 40% of the vote is counted statewide. A big part of this is Dane County, you know, Madison, University of Wisconsin. This is sort of, you know, one of the mother loads of Democratic votes in the state. And you see two-thirds here. Mandela Barnes getting 77% out of here. This is a 
a hair over what Joe Biden got in 2020. So that is, you know, for Democrats, that's kind of the number they want to see just out of a core Democratic area. We also have a fair amount of vote coming out of Milwaukee County. And again, core Democratic, you can see Biden got 69 percent here in 2020. Barnes is running at 67 percent. The way things have usually work in Wisconsin, though, with the vote is that in Milwaukee County, the, the, the city of Milwaukee will basically take the mail-in ballots and they kind of hold them aside and bring them to a central processing facility and they count those at the very end of the night. And those tend to be, obviously, we talk about this, the mail ballots being the most Democratic friendly. So I think there's a chunk of votes in, in a very demo, big and Democratic friendly county that will be counted late in the night that could help Barnes here. You see him running short of Biden's number. Um, what made the difference? Remember, this state in 2020, uh, it was a Trump 16 state. It was Biden 2020, and the margin was 20,000 votes in 2020. Where Donald Trump lost the ground, uh, a couple places, but the key is what they call the wow counties. There's three, uh, Ozaki, I'm doing them out of order here, Washington, and Waukesha. Waukesha, Ozaki, Washington, the wow counties, right? Sort of right outside of Milwaukee, suburban counties here. Trump lost ground in these counties relative to 2016, enough to make a difference between winning a state and losing it by 20,000 votes. So how is Ron Johnson doing compared to Donald Trump in the wow counties? This is good news for Johnson with 80 percent or so of the vote in. He's running three points ahead right now in Waukesha of what uh, uh, of what Trump did. He's running about three points, three and a half points ahead in Washington and in Ozaki County much earlier in the night. He's running about level. So the name of the game for Ron Johnson, that's part of it, is in those Milwaukee suburbs to get back to exceed that Trump number number, name of the game for Democrats, run up the score as much as they can in places like Madison, Milwaukee. There are other areas that we're waiting, Brown County, Green Bay, you know, we're waiting on getting some votes out of here. I think that one will be very interesting. And there's also, there's also a House race. There's a, a House race, the third district uh, in Wisconsin, Democrats trying to hold Trump wanted. It's big. I think we just got some vote out of Arizona. So I'm just going to shift over here. Uh, Let's just call this up because in Arizona, when the vote comes in, it comes in fast. Holy cow. This is what I mean by the vote coming in fast. We've now got more than 40% of the vote in in Arizona's, uh, 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 in Arizona's Senate race here. And you could just see here. Uh, I'm sorry, there are some critical the Blue County. Maricopa County is the mother load. It's more than 60% of the vote in Arizona. And you can see here what happens is they release first in one giant batch the vote, the, the, the uh, early vote, the mail vote that was returned generally by like the Saturday before the election. Okay, that's what happens. That was what, that's what comes out first in Maricopa County. Then for the rest of the night, they report out the same day vote and then tomorrow and later on we're going to get the late arriving early vote. So to take a look here, Kelly leading 59-39 in this initial report out of Maricopa County. I have written down here what the initial report out of Maricopa County was in 2020 and I'm trying to find it. It was, I apologize, here it is, the initial report out of Maricopa County in 2020 was Biden by 10. Uh, in the initial report coming out of Maricopa County here in uh, 2022 is a 20 points. Now, I would the one thing I would caution you on is that 2020 number when Biden led the initial count by 10 uh, in Maricopa it was a much larger share of votes. Uh, it was 71 percent of the total vote in the county. This is a, this is a little bit more than half of the vote. So there's there's the possibility here that, uh, that, that there's more room for masters to make up ground here than Trump had in 2020. Uh, but still, that that is a if you're a Democrat and you see more than half the vote in, in Maricopa County, that's got to be uh, probably encouraging to see. The other place, the other major source of votes in Arizona is Pima County. It's the Tucson area. I kind of expect that any minute now to light up same way with that that early vote, uh, that earliest of the early vote. You get a big chunk that would uh, affect the statewide tally. But statewide, that's what it looks like in the uh, uh, Senate race. And you compare that, by the way, to the governor's race. So there is a bit of a difference there in terms of these ballots. Katie Hobbs, the Democrat, at 55 and a half percent. Mark Kelly, the Democrat, at 56 and a half percent with those votes. And again, that that Pima piece of it that'll come in, that's a, that's a Democratic county. But uh, that Pima piece of it that'll come in in a minute uh, will be significant.
Can I ask our study cam operator if I could see that shot of Steve's papers again? Yeah. <laughs> Really, really organized over here. Okay. You, you were looking down, Rachel, but the most magical part of the moment was that he found what he was I, looking for. Of course. <laughs> like, I mean, like, the, I, don't, I couldn't find what I'm looking for if, in if front of me. If we don't do the slow motion replay, <laughs> yeah. someone right. is going to do it online Correct. for us. The internet will Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. But, so right. We can but own like it he, or they can he own it. it. it I, I, wait, I have some characterizations <laughs> I need to make here. I'm sorry to interrupt, especially given what we were talking about. In the Illinois Senate race, uh, NBC News can now project that in the Illinois Senate race, Democratic incumbent Tammy Duckworth is reelected. Tammy Duckworth will be returning to the United States Senate. In the Georgia Senate race, this was previously characterized as too early to call. This is now too close to call between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker. I don't know, at 49 to 49 with less than <laughs> less than 700 votes between them. How do you call that too close to call? That's with just under 80% of the vote. It is too close to call in the Georgia Senate race. In the Illinois governor's race, NBC News can now project that Democratic incumbent J.B. Pritzker, governor of Illinois, has been reelected. He has defeated his Republican challenger. And in the Wisconsin governor's race, this is previously too early to call. It is now too close to call between Wisconsin Democratic incumbent Tony Evers and his Republican challenger, Tim Michaels. That's with about 43% of the vote in, too close to call in the Wisconsin governor's race. And on that note, I'd like to go to our friend Simone Sanders Townsend, former chief spokesperson for Vice President Kamala Harris. Simone, I know that you've been talking to sources on the ground in Wisconsin. We're obviously watching that Senate race and also that, that governor's race very closely. What are you hearing from your sources? So Democrats on the ground tell me about the governor's race, that they are actually surprised that he's up this early. Uh, and it's a good sign, but they caution that there's still a long way to go. Wisconsin Wisconsin is a place where folks can register to vote on Election Day. Uh, Democrats in the state spent a lot of time and effort to turn out, to increase turnout, particularly among young people and black voters and women. Those were some of the targets. In Milwaukee, for example, a black voter turnout is up. I believe they said over 123 percent at this time in the last midterm election. Young people up 300 percent across the state. They've seen lots of great turnout over long lines on college campuses, uh, universities City of Madison, uh, UW in Eau Claire, in Milwaukee. So people are feeling emboldened, but they do caution that it is going to be a long night. Now, Mandela Barnes' campaign has said that they, um, and Mandela Barnes told me himself that he is used to being the underdog here, and he's fine that people have maybe counted him out, but they are still quite competitive. And I think that we are currently seeing that in the numbers. Again, it's still a long night. Uh, Milwaukee will take a long time to count because different municipalities count differently. It is not a centralized count. And then Dane County, again, where Madison is is still coming in, but they feel good. And I have long since said, Rachel, that I do think that it's not Pennsylvania that is the most flippable seat for Democrats. It is actually Wisconsin. Hmm. And Simone, in, in terms of looking at those two races simultaneously, anything that you're hearing out of the state, anything that you know about these races and the way they're being run, what can you tell us about synergy between the Mandela Barnes campaign and the Tony Evers campaign? Because we're obviously getting reports of votes from the same precincts in the same part of the states, but there's a split with Evers coming in at a higher percentage of the vote than Barnes has at this point. Is there synergy between the two campaigns? Do they see their fortunes as linked? Uh, look, I think that folks think that if Ma, um, Mandela Barnes does well, Governor Evers obviously will do well. There are a camp of people that believe that Governor Evers can do extremely well and win and that Mandela Barnes does not. I think some of the attacks on crime may affect what happens in that race in Wisconsin. The, rate, the, the ads for people who haven't seen them in Wisconsin, they were nasty, they were negative, and they were racist, frankly, as it relates to Mandela Barnes. And people were seeing them on a loop, essentially. While I was on the ground, I, I could literally, I, you could not make, make a move without saying, a negative ad. So that has to account for something. I will tell you, though, folks in Milwaukee specifically, when I talk to black voters on the ground, they all said the same thing about Mandela Barnes, that they see themselves in Mandela Barnes, that they are mm. looking to make history. And I don't think that we can um, underestimate what that means for folks on the ground. And then there's also the issue of abortion. Tony Evers, Mandela Barnes, very staunchly in the We're Gonna Protect Women camp. Tim Michaels, uh, Ron Johnson, very staunchly in the we're going to let this law that's on the books that punishes and vilifies and potentially jails doctors and women stand. That's exactly right. Now, Simone Sanders, thank you very, very much on that. Steve, do you, to, do you want to jump in here for a second? 
Yeah, just an interesting development because you already had that call from the Colorado Senate race here with Michael Bennett getting reelected, and I said it might have some implications for some House seats. Um, it's a bigger story, and we can tell it as the night goes on, but I want to flag this right now because this would be a big surprise. The third district of Colorado, Lauren Whoa. Boebert, the Republican, you could see more than 70% of the vote is in now, and Boebert's trailing by four. Uh, put this in some perspective. Trump won this district 53-45 over Biden. So if you're Adam Frisch, the Democrat, you want to be running five points north of Joe Biden's number in the counties in this district. And if you just start to take a look, you know, 75 percent in, you start to see that that's what he's doing. He's overperforming the Biden number substantially in county after county. Now, there are some heavily Democratic counties. You know, ski country is part of this district. There are some heavily Democratic counties in this district. But even in those heavily Democratic counties, he's overperforming the Biden number. You go to the core Republican counties, you know, he's over. This is interesting right now. When you look at the, the, the vote that's come in. The fact that he's got that lead and that he seems to be consistently outperforming the Biden number across the district, this is certainly on my radar right now. And again, uh, I, I know Democrats nationally have strong feelings about Lauren Boebert. They would like it symbolically. But we are talking right now about the math of House control. This would be most significantly, if Democrats could pull it off, a net gain. They'd be gaining a seat. They'd be offsetting one of those Republican pickups we talked about out of Florida and Georgia earlier in the night. Steve, I'm, I apologize for doing this and springing it on you. I'm going to ask you about a House seat in North Carolina. Yep. Just because in my notes, what I have been writing about the North Carolina 13 race is that Bo Hines is the male Lauren Boebert. Um, and Bo Hines is the Republican candidate in North Carolina 13. More than anybody else, I think, who is a new candidate, I think Bo Hines is a contender to join the Matt Gates, Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene caucus. How is he doing in NC 13? Yeah, so you can, you can see it right here. This is about 75% of the vote in right now, and he's trailing six and a half points against his Democratic opponents, the difference there of just about 13,000 votes. Hines needs to be running. Trump lost this district. This is what this was. This was Ted Budd's district that got, you know, when Ted Budd running for the Senate got dramatically redrawn and went from being a, a core Republican district to one that Biden, under these new lines, actually would have carried by two points. So, again, if you just follow that rule through the, you know, that, uh, that math rule there, Hines needs to be running a couple points ahead of Trump in the counties in the district here. And you just, you know, take a look at it right here. Uh, he is out here in Wayne County, right? Uh, he is not in Johnston County. Johnston County is a big one. This is right outside of Raleigh here. He's not running uh, ahead of the Trump number at all there. And he's two points ahead of it and it's all in in Hardin County. So this is, and then you start getting into, this is where Democrats have their best chance here to, to get this seat. Wake County, you still got a lot of vote come in Wake County. And you, you could look at that. It's already better than a two to one advantage, you know, for Wiley Nickel here. And what's to, you know, this is a same day vote, but in a core Democratic county. So again, this is an opportunity here on why, why I mentioned the Ted Budd piece of it is that if Wiley Nickel wins this mathematically in terms of, you know, again, the, the sort of the accounting, balancing the ledgers for control of the House, this would be a Democratic gain. It would be a net gain if Democrats are able to win this seat. Wow. Uh, we do have a new characterization, a new call, actually, in the Iowa governor's race. NBC News can now project that the Republican incumbent governor of Iowa, Kim Reynolds, uh, has defeated her Democratic challenger, and Kim Reynolds will be reelected as Iowa's Republican governor. You guys, what... Well, Steve was just saying about those house races. I mean, and Lawrence talked about the history of midterms. The incumbent president's party takes a, I mean, I think Obama used the word whooping. I think George Bush used the word thumping. Shellacking. <laughs> Shellacking. Right. I mean, no one has mentioned President Joe Biden yet, but the Democrats who ran on infrastructure um, seem to be doing very, very well. This is not the night Republicans thought they were going to have. This, uh, this comment, let me just reserve space for this comment maybe two hours from now <laughs> if we have the proof of it. But Joe Biden is on the verge of being the most successful Democratic president in a midterm right. election that we have seen in quite some time. Oh, it's, it's, still, early, it's still early in the night. Okay, it uh, is wait, still early right. in the night. But, 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 we, we talk a lot about candidate quality. We should, we, and we talk a lot about how Trump may end up being an albatross. The Democrats look like they've run some pretty good candidates. Yeah. Sherry Beasley. Sorry. 
someone who has not been seen as a national figure, there's not been a lot of attention or resources devoted to that, running a tight race in North Carolina. Tim Ryan in a state where Trump won eight points, running a tight race in Ohio. I mean, and let's not forget, Wes Moore, right? Mendoza. This is a flip. Right. Mendoza is a flip. Yeah. Yeah. Wes Moore is the third black person in U.S. Mm. history to be elected That's as a right. governor. Yeah. We should not lose sight of the strides that Democrats are making independent of Republicans not doing And let me, so let me bring in our friend. saying the same thing right now. I yes. Mean, <laughs> let me bring in our friend Jen Psaki, who wants to get in on this conversation. Jen, one, one, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Jen, was about some of these races that may have symbolic import yeah. in addition to their numerical import. And obviously, that was what we were all thinking when Steve just surprised us with that news about Lauren Boebert in her home district. I know. Look, this is my dad's district in Colorado, and I think we all have these family members who watch MSNBC, and they think they're political experts, and he's been telling me about Adam Frisch for months. <laughs> he's been telling me, this guy, he's really smart. He's really good. He could beat Lauren Boebert. And here we are. And this is the kind of conversation that you have when you're the party that is actually going to win a lot of seats. People who nobody, most people, aside from my dad, have never really heard of, Adam Frisch. I mean, he is sur surpassing expectations. So that's the kind of thing happening right now, um, which is pretty remarkable. I, I will say, Rachel, though, that there are also races that we're talking about that could go the other way, right? That shouldn't because they are in Democratic districts. The night is young. But man, Adam Frisch has my has my uh, award right now for the surprise conversation we're having tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, Jen, I will say we oh, just had ahead. him on the on the show no, a couple of weeks ago. We had him on my show a couple of weeks ago. And what he said was smart. And I grew up in Colorado. So Colorado is a very normie state. You know, it's not Lauren Boebert stands out yeah. as the kind of politician she is. She fit in probably in Florida, but in, in Colorado, <laughs> They tend to like Republicans who are normie. Republicans there tend to be very <laughs> yeah. environment. There's been some you know, hardcore cultural conservative some, movements yeah. in Colorado, Absolutely. though, right? And like there's the, an yeah. evangelical wing of Colorado. There's a part yes. of Colorado that's mm -hmm. super evangelical, and Lauren Boebert fits into that. And, She's and a Christian it's nationalist. A district, but Frisch yeah. is a normal, normie type of guy. Jen, I, Jen, I want to ask you another question. I, I'm getting notes from pollsters who are watching Kornacki and they're watching these margins. And what they're seeing in the margins has them very optimistic about about Fetterman, yeah. very optimistic about New Hampshire. What do you see in the margins that, that, that puts some of these new conversations on the table? As we head into it, Brian Williams used to call it the shank of the night. The <laughs> shank of the night, here we are. <laughs> Look, I think I'm hearing a lot about Pennsylvania and Philly suburbs turnout really looking good for Democrats. And that is a place they really need people to go to the polls and vote. But they also have these early vote numbers that are not going to probably be counted. I mean, some of them are being counted, but it's going to take a while to count them. And as those pr uh, projections have come out, those are very heavily for Democrats. No surprise, given that is a place where Democrats heavily invested. Voting by mail, early voting, was a. they put a lot of money into that. What is also interesting in Pennsylvania, Nicole, on the other side of it, is that Dr. Oz, uh, he really needed to run up or still needs to run up the areas outside of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. We aren't seeing that yet. And ultimately, mm. you have to get more votes from somewhere. And those are where the rural votes are, more Republican votes, more reliable Trump voters or people who may not even like Oz but feel like we want to win the Senate or, keep, or have majority in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So that's all. These margins are interesting because it is not a case where uh, Fetterman's debate performance is bringing him down. There's really not a lot of evidence that, of that at all. And mm -hmm. Democrats are very, very excited and energized in, in Pennsylvania. You're really seeing that today and also in the mail-in numbers. We're yeah. going to go to Steve in just a minute or two um, to put some meat on those bones in terms of what, mm -hmm. Jen, you are hearing out of Pennsylvania and what we are seeing in terms of the vote as it is coming in in Pennsylvania. I do want to give you a couple of updates here. In the governor's race in the great state of Texas, mm -hmm. Republican incumbent Governor Greg Abbott is projected to be the winner. He is reelected. He has defeated Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. Again, Texas Governor Greg Abbott will be returning to office in that state. We have one other race to characterize, though, and this is very interesting. Um, this is a House race. Look at this. Virginia 7th District, Democrat Abigail Spanberger 
projected to be the winner of this race. She is reelected against her Republican wow. challenger, Yesli Vega. We've been watching with Steve the numbers come in on this, watching this as a bellwether race, watching this as a key race in terms of how well Republicans were going to be able to perform pot potentially nationwide tonight. But the early numbers. I will. I mean, as an amateur, looking at these things didn't look promising for Abigail Spanberger, but Congresswoman Spanberger is coming back. She's one of those candidates that ran on the infrastructure bill. She was one of those right. yep, moderate Democrats who were taking advantage of the infrastructure bill. It shows you that Biden, you know, the sort of Biden style of politics is actually having a good night. And mm -hmm. the infrastructure bill works as well as it does because Donald Trump failed so spectacularly on the subject <laughs> Infrastructure week. in a way that is hard to even find a precedent for in presidential <laughs> politics. You know, infrastructure week, and I'm going to be the infrastructure He wanted guy. it so bad. So bad. <laughs> and, and there was not, I mean, let's remember, there was not a single piece of paper written <laughs> to pretend to be an infrastructure bill. There was not a single so committee true. vote in either body. Uh, on it ever, and Joe Biden comes in and rams it through. And Republicans like it, which is why Republicans who voted against it are out right. there trying to take credit. I mean, it's like a spoof, but it, it is it is so popular, which is why um, Donald Trump rolled out Infrastructure Week. Yeah. Like every third week for four years was infrastructure. You need Trump something. Right you need to build something idea. other than a sign that says infrastructure, infrastructure. Right. Right. to actually build infrastructure. Wall. Yeah. Abigail Spanberger is perennially the person we look to as the bellwether yeah. for Democrats. I mean, I spent time with her in 2018. I mean, she is the she is the canary in the coal mine in a lot of ways, literally every election cycle. She's yeah. a great candidate, great campaigner. I'm sure we're going to be reading more. In <laughs> we have a change in characterization in an important Senate race, the Ohio Senate race. This has previously been characterized by NBC News as too early to call. It is still too early to call, but NBC News now says that Republican candidate J.D. Vance is leading in this Ohio Senate race. We're going to be getting more information about that. We're also going to be taking a quick break right now because when we come back, we're going to be getting a... Oh, Oh, sorry, we have another call. I, I hereby interrupt myself to tell you that there is oh, a wow. projection in the Pennsylvania governor's race. Democrat Josh Shapiro is the projected winner against Republican candidate Doug Mastriano. Wow. Uh, in Pennsylvania, again, it is we do not have a characterization of a of a of a winner, let alone a leader even um, in the Senate race. But in this governor's race, NBC News has projected the winner. Josh Sapiro versus Doug Mastriano was one of the starkest. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, I will say the Wisconsin races, the, both yes. the governor's race and the yeah. Senate race in Wisconsin are very, very stark contrast between those candidates. But the Pennsylvania governor's race with Doug Mastriano and Josh Shapiro, it was harder to get two candidates who offered different, different visions for the state that were more different than the it, two. It was the governor's race and the Secretary of State's race because the governor appoints the, the Secretary of State. State. And yeah. what was going to happen in Pennsylvania uh, with Mastriano was one of those issues that, that one of those possibilities that made Joe Biden say democracy is on the ballot. And Pennsylvania Shapiro, could have lost democracy. Shapiro ran on extremism and abortion yeah. and he tied it all together in one of the most powerful speeches of the midterm Saturday night in Philadelphia um, in, a, in that, uh, that big event with President Biden and President Obama. But he ran on abortion. He, he also was the target of anti-Semitic attacks yeah. on a mm -hmm. daily basis. Mastriano yeah. took money from Gab. I mean, it was was sort of the center of the extremist MAGA movement running against a very competent, very message disciplined, very, very good candidate in Josh Shapiro. And by the way, Josh Shapiro, for two, two things. One thing is his margin. If his margin stays looking like that, yes. this yeah. is not a state where you're necessarily going to see people ticket split. There isn't, you can kind of see where there might be a, you know, uh, somebody who would vote for the governor of Georgia, the sitting governor of Georgia, but also vote for Warnock. It's hard to imagine a ticket splitting voter in Pennsylvania. The other thing is that in Philadelphia, one of the things that campaigns that, that, that they were concerned about was can they get the under 25 vote out? Young voters are actually turning out in higher numbers than Democrats actually ex even expected them to. Mm. Josh Shapiro made a big play for younger voters in Philadelphia, for voters of color in Philadelphia who were targeted. And, and those issues, abortion was a huge issue for voters under 25. And so if he maintains that kind of margin, it might be a big enough margin to pull Fetterman over the top. Well, 
well, let's well. let's talk about that with Steve. I was supposed to take like five commercials in the last 15 minutes. I haven't done anything. We won't pay for this. I hereby <laughs> apologize to whoever is not getting paid because I'm not doing that. But as long as we're talking about this is a very good point that Joy is making about what the overall statewide race, the overall statewide contest looks like in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And with NBC News now projecting at this hour at 10:30 a winner in the governor's race, Amazing. we don't have a projection in in, in the Penn, in the Pennsylvania Senate race. But Steve, can you tell us anything about synergy between those two campaigns and what this means for Fetterman? Yeah, I mean, so to put it in perspective, Shapiro declared the winner. You see what the governor's race looks like right now. Now, keep your eye on that. I'm going to flip it over to the Senate race, and you'll see 55.7 down to 50.5. So Fetterman is essentially running five points behind uh, uh, behind Shapiro in the Senate race. And right now, it gives Fetterman an advantage of three and a half points with that same sort of collection of votes. Now, what's interesting is we start looking at this point in the night for where are counties that are fully counted or almost fully counted. How is Fetterman's number looking there? So let's take you through a bunch of those. Let's start in Lackawanna County. It's almost all counted. There is still a little bit more vote to come in here, but I think this is significant. Remember, Biden won Pennsylvania. He won it by 80,000 votes. It was very close. If you're Fetterman, you want to be hitting and ideally exceeding the Biden number in every county that you can. So in Lackawanna County, big one, Scranton, there you go. Fetterman with only a few precincts left, I think not many votes, running three points better than Joe Biden. Uh, you take a look. Wow. This is a Republican county, right? Almost all in. Fetterman's running half a point better than Biden. Oz is running a little bit worse mm. than Trump. You start to see these throughout the state. Let's take a look. Go up again. This is Western Pennsylvania, small county. But this is again, Trump ran up huge numbers in Western Pennsylvania in small counties. Mehmet Oz is going to win Clearing County overwhelmingly. It's all in, but it's five points less than Trump got. Mm. You, know, you wow. take a look. Let's go down to Bedford County, all in, core Republican. Oz gets 80.7. What did Trump get? He got 83 and a half. Let's go next door to Fulton County. Trump got 85 and a half. Oz is sitting worse than that. Noticing a pattern here? Take a look at Franklin County. Trump got 71. Oz got 69. These are completed counties. And right now, you're not seeing any of them that I just took you through where Oz is even hitting the Trump number. And the Trump number was not <laughs> enough to carry the state in 2020. Now, so much of the attention, ultimately, when, when this picture comes into focus, is going to be on these four counties at, right outside of Philadelphia, these big suburban counties. We don't have as much of the vote in from there. But the simplest reason why Donald Trump lost Pennsylvania in 2020 after winning it in 2016 was in these four counties. It was in Delaware, Chester, Montgomery. Montgomery and Bucks County. If, if Donald Trump lost them all in 16 and he lost them all in 20, if he had lost them in 20 by only the margin he lost them in 16, it basically would have been enough for him to win the state. It basically would have erased that Biden advantage. So again, we don't have as much vote in from here, but we're going to be keeping an eye on these big counties. This is where, Dem I mean, again, you're looking at like Montgomery. It's not, this is mail vote from a, a core Democratic suburban county. So we can't really put this number in perspective yet till we get the same day. You know, Bucks County, again, we're looking heavily at mail vote here. Delaware County, we're looking at mail vote. So we want to see the picture that emerges in these suburban counties here. But the, what I just took you through and all those other, we're going to take you through here and Oz to have any chance has got to be exceeding Trump's 2020 numbers in all of these suburban Philadelphia counties, especially given what seems to be happening in the rest of the state. And I'll just say, show you one more here because we're now getting close to 90 percent in Allegheny County. Remember, they had that big mail vote dump at the start of the night. We said it would get more Republican. But again, where Oz is trying to get here is to 40 percent. And we're at about 90 percent of the vote in in Allegheny County. Mm. He's moved his number up from where it started, but he's at 34. He wants to be at 40 in Allegheny County. Steve, um, this is a question that may be coming from a point of ignorance, and so feel free to tell me if my premise is wrong. But I reported yesterday on John Fetterman's essentially public memo, kind of a public letter telling the media and telling his supporters how to think about the results as they were coming in in Pennsylvania. And he was saying the way that Pennsylvania is forced to count by law is something that's going to make it look like the Democrat is well behind. And so even though the Republicans may look like they're way ahead, we 
have to wait till it's all in. Everybody has to be patient because the surge in Democratic votes will come in late. He was describing that procedurally to people to sort of set expectations for what the vote count would be like. Was he wrong in describing that that's how the vote would come in? Or is he just doing better than expected? And so it doesn't look like the Republicans ahead, even though that is the way the vote is being counted. No, he was he was describing. I, I, I heard a lot of this. I felt, it, 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 you know, a lot of expectations for how the vote was going to be reported in Pennsylvania and other states was based on how it was reported in the 2020 election. Uh, okay. And we were getting indications from election officials that they had, in their view, learned some lessons and come up with new plans. And so that's why right off the bat tonight, if, if folks were watching, they saw right off the bat within five minutes of poll closings, we got a hundred something thousand male votes out of Allegheny County, totally different than 2020. And then a few minutes later, we got something like 60,000 male votes out of Philadelphia. Again, totally different. And a bunch of other counties released huge batches of mail votes. So Fetterman started the night. It, it really looks like the complete opposite of 2020 when Donald Trump built that big lead based on the same day vote. We've seen Fetterman build a big early lead in the tally based on the mail vote being released first in so many places. And then Oz playing catch up as the Republican counties in the same day voters come in. But as we're showing you, this really becomes a test of, all right, fine. We got 61% in statewide. Let's look at the counties where we got all the vote and let's measure them against 2020 and let's see if one party's doing a little better or a little worse than 2020 and so far the trend that we're seeing there's a lot more still to come here but the trend that we're seeing is that Oz isn't really hitting those Trump 2020 numbers he's coming very close but he's not quite hitting them and Fetterman's doing a little bit better than those Biden 2020 numbers and again Biden won the state by 80,000 votes in 2020 so I'm really eager to see as these more votes come into these Philadelphia suburbs obviously we underscore how crucial that is but it's a it's an entirely different vote reporting pattern mm. than we saw in 2020. Steve, we want to stick with this for just a second. And Nicole has to, a question to ask you, but I'm going to interrupt before I allow you to do that. I'm sorry, because <laughs> I have a characterization uh, to make. In the Missouri Senate race, NBC News is now projecting at this hour that in the Missouri Senate race, the Republican candidate Eric Schmidt is the, project, the projected winner. Again, Missouri Senate. Uh, also in the Iowa Senate race, uh, longtime incumbent Republican Chuck Grassley is projected to be reelected to his seat. We also have a change in characterization in one governor's race. Now, this is the governor's race in Kansas. This is an interesting governor's race where we've got an incumbent Democrat, Democratic Governor Laura Kelly. This was previously characterized as too early to call. It's now too close to call between Laura Kelly uh, and her Republican challenger, Derek Schmidt. Again, Kansas governor is now too close to call. We do have a projection in the New Mexico governor's race, though. The incumbent Democrat there, Michelle Lujan Grisham, is projected to be reelected as New Mexico governor. She faced a strong challenge from Mark Ronchetti, the Republican in that race, but Michelle Lujan Grisham will be governor for another term in New Mexico. Nicole, you wanted to ask Steve oh, it, something about Pennsylvania. Yeah, Steve, a, a Democratic operative suggested to me today that one of the unknowns would be the same day or the election day Democratic vote. Is there anything surprising you about how that's coming in? Well, that's, that is, I, I think, largely what we're waiting to find out about in these Philadelphia suburbs. Because, again, you look at a place like Delaware County right now, this can be a core Democratic county, but, I mean, you're looking at mail ballots here to give Fetterman that kind of early advantage. You look at a place like Montgomery County, you're looking at mail ballots here to give, I mean, to put this in some perspective, Montgomery County is a core Democratic county, big one, right outside Philadelphia. It was 26 points for Biden. So when you're seeing Fetterman jump to this lead, this is mail ballots right now. So it remains to be seen when the same day gets counted, tallied, and released, where does this, this Fetterman number will come down? How far will it come down? Will it land north of that Biden number, at that Biden number. Oz is really going to need it to land south of that Biden number. Um, I mean, if you could send this back one time, this is the, the, the point I was making. Trump got clobbered in the uh, Philadelphia suburbs in both 2016 and 2020. But Montgomery, he lost by 21 points in 2016, and he lost it by 26 points in 2020. This is the difference. If, if he had had the 2016 performance in Montgomery and in Bucks and in Chester and in Delaware, that basically would have erased the 80,000 vote margin that Joe Biden won the state by. So, you know, if you're, if you're Mehmet Oz, 
you came into the night wanting to get Trump's 2016 levels in the Philadelphia suburbs. The way it's going elsewhere, you may need to even exceed those. But it remains to be seen because we're just we're waiting on the same day vote in those counties right now, and I think that's going to be potentially the ball game. I want to get a little bit of expert help on these Pennsylvania numbers that we're looking at uh, from somebody who has been there and done that. David Pluff is one of our political insiders tonight. He's been watching these numbers and these results come in alongside us. David, I wanted to get your take on the win by Democrat Josh Shapiro in the Pennsylvania governor's race and what now looks to be a, a very close but very well-fought race uh, for that Senate seat. Well, first, Rachel, Josh Shapiro ran just a fantastic race. Ost you know, Mastriano is a weak candidate, but it's still Pennsylvania. So I think we should all look very carefully at the campaign he ran and won uh, and where he really, uh, you know, put up great margins. Uh, but, you know, Steve took us through the map. I mean, that's what Democrats have to do in places like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan. If we're ever going to get competitive against statewide in Ohio and Iowa, we got to cut down those rural margins and those exurban margins. And that's what Oz has done. Uh, so, you know, Pennsylvania is looking very strong right now. And I think, listen, we still have to see what happens out west. But, you know, I think you might be able to say Donald Trump has now presided over two disastrous midterm elections. The one when he was in the White House uh, in 2018. But given the history, uh, presidents in power, Democrats controlling all of Washington, uh, inflation, uh, you know, this should have been a much stronger night for Republicans. Bunch of reasons for that. But at the top of them is Donald Trump. He's deeply unpopular. He supported a bunch of horrible Senate candidates who may end up coughing up the football here, uh, Pennsylvania being a great example of that. David, can I ask you while we've got you um, if there's any single result or any single trend that's evident thus far that surprised you the most tonight? Obviously, all of us looking at this stuff and hearing both sides make their projections, you sort of weigh everything based on what you know and what you can view yourself. But as somebody who's been inside these kinds of campaigns, what has struck you as legitimately unpredictable in tonight's results? Well, first of all, the dir divergence between Florida, which, you know, can't sugarcoat a disaster for the Democrats, but there's an aisle, there's a moat around Florida. <laughs> you know, the rest of the country, I think Republicans are underperforming expectations. And there has been no surprise Republican win. If anything, we may be looking at some surprise Democratic wins like the Boba race uh, in Colorado. I'm going to be looking very carefully at the Hispanic vote, though, in places like Nevada and Arizona. Uh, I don't think we're going to see anything like we saw in Florida, of course. Uh, but you'd like to see, as a Democrat, you know, you'd like to see the margins that we've historically gotten there, which is how we win those uh, tough races. But that has struck me. And I, I think as we unpack this, places like New Hampshire, places like Colorado, Republicans, you know, Rachel, just in the last few days, we're talking about those could be races they could win, and they're going to lose them pretty soundly. Uh, and so I think a lot of suburban college educated debaters, once again, we saw it in 18, we saw it in 20, not just stuck with the Democratic Party and their candidates, but must have produced pretty strong turnout. David Pluff, thank you very much. It's 1045 right now on the East Coast, which means our next poll closings are going to be at 11 p.m. at the top of this hour. At 11 p.m., we'll be looking at poll closings in California, in Idaho, in Oregon, and in Washington. One of the so-called sleeper races of the year this year is that Washington, excuse me, that Oregon governor's race, uh, where there's basically a three-way race going on, which may put Oregon in the position of potentially having a potentially having a Republican governor, despite Oregon uh, leaning so blue overall as a state. We have a characterization to make in another closely watched House race. This is Kansas, the third district. This is a race where you've got both interesting candidates on both sides, but also one of those districts that's seen as a potential bellwether. This was a pickup the Republicans really wanted. They did not get it. This is Kansas's third congressional district. The incumbent Democrat there is Sharice Davids. Her Republican challenger was Amanda Adkins. I think Republicans expected this one, but NBC News can now project that the winner will be Sharice David. She will be returning to the House. Uh, Steve, as we tick through some of these House races, obviously we're looking at individual ones for bellwether status and for just resonance status, but then there's the overall numbers too in terms of control of the House. Is it conceivable that the Republicans won't win control of the House? I mean, is that even within the realm of possibility? Yeah, at this point it is. It's, it's conceivable. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's not a prediction or anything, but I'm I, I'm telling you, I keep wow. checking the, I have no sense of time here, so I'm looking. It's 10:45 p.m. and it, well, I mean, I'll, I'll take you through some of these New York seats that are interesting, but why don't we start then on that big picture question and take a look at the house here? And again, 
we organize this sort of by tier here, starting with the front line of Republican attack here. These are the most vulnerable Democratic seats on paper just because these are the Democratic seats that voted for Donald Trump. Now, what you see, you see five, everyone's red is a Republican flip. And these are all districts we, we basically teed up at the start of the night. The three in Florida, along with Georgia and Tennessee, five. All five of these districts in redistricting were redrawn basically in a way to elect Republicans. They all elected Republicans. They all represent flips. We came into the night knowing that there was almost no circumstance where Democrats would win a single one of these. So those were the five that were kind of baked in. But notice that nothing else has been colored in on this first line of attack for Republicans. And in fact, let's start going through some of these. Ohio's ninth district, we've been following this story tonight. Marcy Kaptur now up to about three quarters of the vote in. And again, Lucas County, we got a lot of votes still to come in Lucas County, Democratic part of that, uh, uh, of that district. We just showed you Lackawanna County in Pennsylvania where John Fetterman, run, most of the voters in, and John Fetterman is running ahead of the Biden number. The congressman from that area is Matt Cartwright. There's more vote to be counted, but Cartwright, you see, with more than half the vote, and you see the advantage he has. Now, again, there's some, discre there's some disparities here in terms of, you know, the mail vote, the, the share that this accounts for, but the Democrats are very much in the game here. The second district of Maine, this is, you know, Donald Trump has won the electoral vote from this district. In Maine, they give out the electoral votes by congressional district. Trump twice won this district, twice got an electoral vote out of it. Jared Golden trying to defend the seat. He's running against Bruce Poliquin, who he unseated in 2018. One thing to keep in in mind here is that Maine does instant runoff voting. So if Golden finishes ahead of Poliquin but short of 50, they would go to an instant runoff. Steve, I'm yep. sorry to interrupt you. We have an important call in a very closely watched race. This is a Senate race projection in the great state of New Hampshire. Republicans really wanted to pick off incumbent Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan. They have failed in their efforts to do so. Maggie Hassan, the incumbent Democratic Senator, will be returning to the United States Senate, having beaten back a challenge from Republican Don Balduck. Don Balduck was not the person who odds makers wanted to win on the Republican side if they were hoping for a closer contest there. But he put up a race against her that put the fear into Democrats that they might lose that seat. At this this hour, the Democrats hold 42 seats, the Republicans hold 43, 15 seats remain undecided. Steve, back to you. Oh, yeah. sorry, hold on, I've been told that I should not go back to you, because I can interrupt myself again. <laughs> In the Connecticut U.S. Senate race, the Democratic incumbent Richard Blumenthal will also be returning to the United States Senate. Again, so we've just had calls in New Hampshire and in Connecticut, Democratic incumbents winning those seats and will be reelected. That puts us at 43-43 as the balance of power in seats that have been assigned to either party. In the Senate, 14 seats remain undecided. Am I going to interrupt myself again? I think we need those <laughs> memes. We need a meme of two Rachels, like the Spider-Man meme, where they're like facing each other. We need to be a Rachel and a Rachel. I can just each actually other. just hit myself. I can just do that. Rachel and anger Rachel. Exactly. I just say, no. If we're still here, Chase Oliver down in Georgia. Yeah. He's the like 43, 43. This could come down to Georgia and the Libertarian right who's pulling two points. Can we put up the two board <laughs> on the? Okay. Well, that's a three board. It has to be. So right now, this is 83 percent in. Neither Walker nor Warnock is at 50%. This is considered to be too close to call. The reason Mr. Oliver is there, even though he doesn't have a chance, is because what he does have a chance of doing is denying either candidate the yeah. chance to get to 50%. And if neither of them gets to 50%, there's another election on the 6th. On December 6th, which very well could decide control of the, the Senate. And it will come down to that that guy, Chase Oliver, who was not, I mean, it won't. We don't know at this stage, but the, the weirdness of all of it. Yeah. I mean, well, just to make it even worse, I mean, there's a possibility, just talking with folks in New Hampshire, I mean, in Nevada, that that one might come down to some issues as well, that that race is very sluggish and there's some issues with mail. So if that also becomes a kind, I mean, you could literally have two races in this cycle that are, you know, remember when that happened with Al Franken? It took six months mm, to we're figure not, out. Don't even say that. <laughs> I know, Just not to bring up a Erase that. Bring it back. From the air, take it back. Okay, there are two me's now, and one of them is good. <laughs> <laughs>
Our friend Chris Hayes is with the Political Insiders right now. Boy, has a lot happened in the last 20 minutes or so. Uh, Chris, we want to hear from you guys on this. Um, a lot has happened. I am processing it all uh, here with David Pluff, Jen Psaki, and uh, Michael Steele. Uh, where should we start? Let's start on Shapiro. Yeah. Which um, I think, you know, the, the p polling expectation was that he would win. Yeah. But the call this early in the night has to leave Democrats feeling pretty good. Yeah, he ran a great race. Uh, and he's actually a Democrat that a lot of Democrats should watch because he ran, was running such a good race and was, you know, so ahead for so long. I don't know that a lot of people tuned in closely, uh, but it's good for other Democrats running in Pennsylvania. It's good for Fetterman as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a very good sign right there. This night is very different. So we were just talking about this than what we all thought this night was going to look like. I agree with you. Say more about that. Well, I think early on, for the last couple of days, there has been this sort of doomsday red wave Absolutely. prediction, right? And most of the Democrats I have been talking to have said, make sure people know that early vote and vote by mail could be counted late. It's going to be really close. And a lot of these races will be very close. But there are races that were that Democrats are winning. Abigail Spanberger, for example, is a big, big, big win for Democrats. The Rhode Island congressional race, which the Republicans were thinking they were going to win. Uh, the New Hampshire, I'm hearing from New Hampshire folks on the ground. They're feeling very good about the House races, about Maggie Hassan. Those are all races just a couple of days ago that people were predicting wouldn't be won by Democrats. There was a narrative that be became increasingly untethered from the data at a certain point. And I even I got up to walk my dog like 5.30 in the morning made the mistake of checking Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm going to make a projection right now. We have a projection in that Ohio Senate race where NBC News is currently projecting that J.D. Vance, he of formerly Yale Law, Silicon Valley, uh, and Hillbilly Elegy will be joining the U.S. Senate, defeating Tim Ryan, a congressman from Youngstown area, who ran a, what everyone thought was a great race. But those numbers there, 54-46, as we're projecting this, Michael Steele, they look like the gravity of the partisan makeup of Ohio in the year 2022 pulling that race to its fundamentals. Yeah, and in many respects, that's true. I, I think the other dynamic when you look at that race, particularly given uh, the way the Democrats um, sort of looked at it themselves. Because um, they didn't send any money. They didn't send any money. <laughs> the brother's out here by himself going, <laughs> uh, hello, I can win this. And so I, I, you have to take that 7% differential, I think, with a little bit of salt there because it's, it's not necessarily effective of a fully a full-throated competitive campaign from, from the national level to DNC, right. state party organizations, coordinating to win that race. And we should also say on not the other side... Not to take away from Vance. Not no, to take not at all. France, but we should but say on the other saying. side, the Senate Leadership Fund, which is a super PAC that McConnell essentially controls, did put money in there. That's right. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But I think there's not a... What's fascinating about tonight, the, the margin in Florida might have been surprising in terms of Republican. There's not a single race so far... Uh, we still have a lot of Western races to count. Uh, that's been a surprise Republican win. Right. Uh, and listen, I think one of the reasons that there was so much doom and gloom is because of polling. You know, in 16, a little bit in 18 in some places, certainly in 20, and there's a belief, well, if a poll shows a Democrat up 47 and 45, they must really be down yeah. 51, 49. Yeah. And clearly the bottom did not fall out. And I think you're seeing exceptional performance uh, in suburban areas by Democrats, which has been such a strength of us uh, in prior elections. You know, when we, when we look at that Ohio race that we just called for J.D. Vance, who will be joining the U.S. Senate, uh, it appears, mm -hmm. according to MEC projections, that margin is about the Trump margin. Right. So when you're looking like look at Spanberger, that was a uh, you know, that was a Biden plus seven. Her yeah. New seat. She's running at about plus four. It was a Yunkin win. Right. So in terms of where we are and what the electorate is showing up, what they look like, they're looking like a 2020 ish electorate, maybe a little more as opposed to. You know, a 2010 election yeah, or 2014. Right, yeah. I think this is such, a, yeah, yeah. such an important. I mean, this was supposed to be an election where Joe Biden lost so many seats. It was embarrassing for him to wake up tomorrow morning yes. and be president, and it is not going to be. I will say, I disagree with you a little bit on Ohio. Yeah. Um, Democrat. There's always like you should put more money in every race. Money does not grow on trees in politics. We know that. And in this race, it's about the margin, as you said, that Trump won, beat Biden by, and Tim Ryan ran a great race. And he's very
very much a candidate who fits Ohio. So to me, it still raises the question of whether Ohio is a state that you're going to invest in and spend money in moving forward. But from see, a can I, can yeah, I just, as, a, as the only chairman at right, the table yeah, yeah, here yeah. who's had to make these yeah. decisions, yeah. You gotta call the shot, right? And you gotta do the. It's not just the analytics; it's what the ground is telling you. Right. And if if the candidate, if you got a candidate like Tim, on on a ground like Ohio, and we saw the races, the the data before we get to tonight, yep. that showed the competitiveness of the race. It showed. Then you gotta make a call and go. You know what? Out of 50 uh, races around the country in each of these states, we're going to put a little extra love. Well, where on this do you one. not spend money then? And Sherry Beasley looked well, even is, closer well, than is, Tim Ryan. This was the thing I was going to say. We didn't have that problem in 2010. We spent it everywhere. And it's called planning, it's called understanding where your ground game is going to be, and putting the resources there, not two weeks into the cycle, but 18 months okay. out, well, but 15 but, months out. But in terms of that, in terms of this North Carolina race, yeah. right, because the, the yeah. Sherry Beasley was a very similar story, which she's running closer. That's a place where you might see even more of that Monday morning quarterbacking yeah. of Well, because you can that. do a lot with turnout in North Carolina. But let's be honest, a former campaign manager. Yeah. Good campaigns don't make up six, eight point losses. Mm -hmm. Okay. They can basically maybe get you a point, point and a half. So even in North Carolina, it could have been very close. I will say this you talked about Shapiro. So particularly if Ohio and Iowa and Florida are not going to be core battleground targets for Democrats. I hope they mm -hmm. come back, but let's be realistic right now. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin must be. Shapiro's victory, Fetterman's performance. Uh, Michigan looks very good right now for Democrats mm -hmm. up and down the ballot. Wisconsin's going to be close. In a non-presidential year, it shows that we still have a pathway to put all those blue in 24. Final, final, very quickly. Sure. Mastriano, Bulldog, these like Trump MAGA guys. I just feel like one of the lessons tonight is like you can only, you can't throw these people in the electorate and just yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a lesson you've learned. That's a lesson you've learned. That's a lesson you've yeah. learned and me learned. Yes. The party has matter. That's right. And that's, that's the question, though. That's the question Candidates after matter. tonight. Candidates, Candidates matter. Candidate quality matters. Back to you, Right.